In this video, we'll discuss overconfident nerds. Hey, Betty, looking good. Failed quick time events. I'm going to die. And why exactly both the Spider-Man 3 movie and game seem to struggle to live up to the expectations of their predecessors. Isn't this sweet? Just like in the movies. But to properly do so, I think we need to start at the beginning with the development of Spider-Man 3 The Game by Treyarch. Development lasted for nearly three years and began in 2004, shortly after the release of Spider-Man 2. With their last game being such a success, Treyarch aimed to bring back everything that fans enjoyed about it, while also expanding on those mechanics and incorporating new features as well. These ambitions were made possible in thanks to Spider-Man 3 releasing on, what was at the time, next-gen hardware, the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. In an interview with Games Radar, Treyarch producer Greg John states, the Spider-Man 3 City is over 25% bigger than the Spider-Man 2 version and is a lot more detailed. With the new consoles, we were able to make Manhattan look simply gorgeous. And yes, we've introduced 10 miles of subways and 10 miles of sewers, in which some of the most exciting missions take place. The realism really enforces the player's sense of immersion into the life of Spider-Man. Interestingly, the idea of a full-blown sewer system originated during Spider-Man 2, and a lot of it was even built. Unfortunately, due to time, it had to be cut, so the concept was then brought back for Spider-Man 3. Contained within Spider-Man 2's cut sewer area was also a story involving Kraven the Hunter, Calypso, and the Lizard. Those missions were recycled into Spider-Man 3 as well, so we'll discuss them more a bit later in the video. For Spider-Man 3, Treyarch also wanted to improve the combat, so they created a new combat system that incorporates more combos, as well as more web-based attacks. However, I also found some of their scrapped gameplay ideas interesting. For example, there were early prototypes for stealth missions that didn't make the cut. These were spearheaded by developer Jamie Fristrom, who was promoted to be one of two creative directors on Spider-Man 3 after pioneering Spider-Man 2's innovative web-swinging system. I actually had the opportunity to chat with Jamie about his experience on both games, so I'll sprinkle in details from our conversation in this video. For starters, here's how he describes the stealth missions he was working on. We we prototyped a whole stealth level, a, co a couple sets of missions that some people thought were really cool, other people did not think were so cool. If you played Neversoft Spider-Man, it was a lot like that one level where you're going up on the ceiling, you kind of have to take out the uh, individual. Oh yeah, the bank heist, I think was that yeah, one? Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, it had a lot of that, um, but it was kind of more elaborate. You would go up on the ceiling, it would notice you up there and you could like crawl over them and drop down on them and, and take them out. And you could like web them to the ceiling, leave them stuck there. And if you're careful about uh, how you how you approach the level, you could take it out almost entirely by stealth. But if somebody caught you, you just, then it would be a fight and they'd summon the other guards and then you'd have to resort to combat. And it would be a very challenging combat. So it, you were incentivized to, uh, to find a stealthy way through. Like the Batman Arkham games had a similar feel in a lot of ways. Up in the rooftops, not able to be seen by the guys and then you know when nobody else is looking you take out one at a time right arkham was very tight it felt very snappy uh, uh like our prototypes felt a bit looser than that but also felt a bit more open-ended like you could kind of go anywhere instead of going from just point to point in the early months of development, there was also a different combat system in the works, created by Tomo Moriwaki. This system actually anticipated a lot of what Rocksteady would do a couple years later in their Batman Arkham games, since it was more of a flow system allowing Spider-Man to freely bounce between enemies and mix up his targets. The animation team was also heavily involved, providing a strong variety of animations to make Spider-Man's movements between enemies look very natural and seamless. Personally, I thought this system sounded very cool, especially after hearing about it in more detail from Tomo himself. So later in the video, when we talk about cut content, I'll play some clips from that interview so you can get a better idea of how that system would have worked. But from here, I want to start getting into the story of the game. Before jumping directly in though, I want to take a moment and describe what you can expect from this video. We'll primarily focus on Spider-Man 3 the game and walk through it together, while along the way discussing behind the scenes details, easter eggs, and how it compares to the film, as well as the comics. I should also mention that I decided to play the PS3 version specifically, emulated on RPCS3. I chose this version mainly because I already own the PS3 Collector's Edition, and the emulator allowed me to boost the graphics. However, I also want to explore the PS2 version developed by Vicarious Visions. It largely follows the main narrative of the Treyarch version, but makes a few changes that I found interesting, including a Morbius level not found in the Treyarch game. It also features different gameplay choices that I think will be interesting to compare and contrast. For the PS2 version, I recorded gameplay using the emulator PCSX2 so we can get some prettier graphics for the video. But with that said, let's begin. The story begins with a helicopter fleeing from a building. Inside the helicopter is a villain we'll come to know as the Mad Bomber, who gives the order to have the building blown up. As the camera returns to the building, we see it's named Carlisle Industries, which will have some importance later in the game. For now, Spider-Man swings in to the rescue to help anyone still inside. Hello. 
autographs, please. As you heard, Tobey Maguire has once again returned to reprise his role from the film. Joining him this time are actually a pretty significant amount of actors from the movie, more than the previous two games. For example, for the first time in this game trilogy, James Franco is actually voicing his character Harry Osborn, and J.K. Simmons is voicing J. Jonah Jameson. Thomas Hayden Church voices Sandman, and Topher Grace is voicing Eddie Brock. Also returning is Bruce Campbell as the narrator of the game. In the movies, Bruce Campbell is known for his cameos, like as the ring announcer in Spider-Man 1, the theater bouncer in Spider-Man 2, and the Mater D in Spider-Man 3. Hello. It was later revealed that he would have had a minor cameo in Spider-Man 4 as well, likely as Mysterio. There are even some concepts online showing Spider-Man hauling him into jail. In the games, though, Bruce is known for giving tutorials to the player, and like in the last two games, Bruce teaches the fundamentals of the gameplay while also showing a severe lack of respect for the player. Now, I consider myself a fine judge of talent boy, and, well, you don't have much. However, I was a little disappointed at the extent Bruce was utilized. His humor was a real highlight in the last game, and he sounded like he was having a lot of fun with that performance, but in Spider-Man 3, he doesn't have as much of that energy, and at times, he feels more like a standard tutorial giver. You gotta take care of those bombs. Just crawl up the wall and onto the ceiling. You need to be on the ceiling to deactivate these bombs. Oh, this icon here means that you can perform a web interaction. Hold down the web button to web this thing up. Another thing I liked about his role in the Spider-Man 2 game was that there were hidden voice lines of his if you did something unexpected, like fall to your death during slow motion. Hit the swing button, will ya? Ouch. I would work on that landing. Remember, it isn't falling that hurts you, it's the sudden stop at the end. Or if you manage to die during the tutorial. Well, I'm not sure how you managed to die. I mean, seriously, unless you're a professional game tester, there's no reason for you to be dying yet. Oh, and if you are a professional game tester, we're, we're, good job, keep up the good work, of course. <laughs> so in Spider-Man 3, I tried to test the game in a very similar way to see if I could trigger any hidden voice lines, but sadly, it doesn't seem like any were recorded. For example, I tried dying again, but your health bar just refills. I also tried walking into fire, and I tried falling into fire during a jump tutorial. These are things I expect Bruce to yell at me for, but nothing happened. There was, however, this one if you ignored his instructions during the combat section. Hey, that was a really nice try, but no. This time, do the moves I'm asking you so we can move on. There were also times where I'd walk into a room expecting him to give me instructions, but I'd only receive a tutorial box with text in it. My suspicion is that maybe certain things were added later and they couldn't get him back to record lines for it, but that's my own speculation. Ultimately, I got somewhat of an inconsistent vibe from the Bruce Campbell tutorials this time around. That's not to say they weren't enjoyable, since there were still some fun ones that I encountered, such as this one making fun of Spider-Man by comparing him to Superman. Jump higher by holding down the jump button longer. Get it? Higher, longer. Hold it down long enough, and you can probably leap small buildings in a single bound. I mean, you're not quite as impressive as that other guy, are you? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm sure you have a lovely personality. Interestingly, I thought he sounded way better in the PS2 version. All the energy that I'm missing in the PS3 version, I'm definitely getting in PS2. In real life, it's called Assault and Battery, but in here it's called Melee Combat and it's just good, clean fun. So go ahead and beat up those bad guys. Drop them like a bad habit. Soften them up with some quick attacks, then nail them with a strong hit. What would Spider-Man be without his spider powers? I'll tell you. He'd be... Man. Is that what you came here to play? Man 3? I don't think so. Now go ahead and crawl up this wall. You know, like Spider-Man. Are you troubled by bad guys who move too fast? Ask your doctor about web splats. Proven in lab tests to slow bad guys down by up to 80%. Web splats aren't for everyone. Side effects may include headache, nausea, and diarrhea. Do you see what I mean? It's like a night and day difference. But let's return back to the PS3 version and get into the most notorious tutorial, the quick time events. If you're unfamiliar with the term quick time events or QTEs, they're basically interactive cutscenes where you have to press a button when it appears on screen to successfully progress. I'm personally not a big fan of QTEs and I think the Spider-Man 3 game is a good lesson on why you shouldn't use them or at the very least, why you need to be cautious with how much you use them. We'll spend plenty of time discussing quick time events in this video, I'm sure of it, but for now, you can see on screen how goofy things can look when you miss the button press. But none of these compare to the final button prompt, which has actually resurfaced and become somewhat of a meme again in recent years, and for good reason. So here it is again, for your viewing pleasure. Help! Please! Someone! I'm going to die! 
I think what's really putting it over the top is the splat sound effect when Spider-Man hits the ground, and then how huge and bug-eyed this woman's face is. And I just want to set the expectation now that although there are more funny QTE fail screens that I'll show later, none of them can match this one. It truly takes the cake, rivaling even some of the worst Heavy Rain QTEs. It also encapsulates a lot of the problems that are prevalent throughout the rest of this game, such as the over-reliance on QTEs, paired with really goofy-looking fail screens. Also, the really strange-looking character models. As we continue, I think you'll see this hostage isn't the only one who looks sort of rough around the edges. But continuing forward, if you successfully hit the right series of buttons, Spider-Man will zip the hostage out of the window to safety. From here, we get a cutscene that sets the stage for the story of the game. Just another day in the life of your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Lately, things have been going my way. I got the girl, and New York finally likes me. Not that there aren't problems. Like this new guy, Eddie Brock, at the Daily Bugle. He's really starting to get on my nerves. And Harry, my best friend, won't talk to me. On top of that, new gangs have moved in, and they're dividing up the city. Still, it's nothing I can't handle. One weird thing, there haven't been any big supervillains around since Doc Ock. But I have this bad feeling like the sky is gonna fall or something. And soon. We're then dropped into the open world and given our web-swinging tutorial. Of course, Spider-Man 2 is known for its innovative web-swinging system, so how does Spider-Man 3 build on that? Well, I actually think it's pretty good. To me, it feels like a natural progression from the swinging established in the last game. It can still take some mastery, like in Spider-Man 2, but it overall feels smoother and allowed me to further immerse myself as Spider-Man. The immersion in particular is enhanced by the improved swinging animations. Spider-Man's movements flow naturally along with each swing and look acrobatic, and further sell the fluidity of the swing, so I think Treyarch's animation team really nailed it this time around. Even better though, Spider-Man has some subtle animation differences when using the black suit. For example, the way he dives through the air with his hands forward, which I didn't experience while wearing the red suit. He dives like this a bit in the movie too, so I thought that was a nice touch. To tie in the comics as well, I think that shot from the movie may have been inspired by this artwork from the comics. Another animation difference is the way he arcs his body to the side at the beginning of his swings while wearing the black suit, like he's throwing his weight around a bit more in it, compared to the red suit where his movements look more precise and weightless. I'm really liking these subtle changes to Spider-Man's movements between the two suits and how they emphasize the power and personality differences of Peter within them. So overall, I'm very positive about the swinging and animations in the game. If you're wondering how Jamie felt about the swinging in 3, he stated he liked it and also complimented the Insomniac games. I, I still liked it. And I felt like the swing in Spider-Man 2 was where I wanted it game-wise. My big frustration with it was that it was so inaccessible that so many people had to spend so much time trying to figure it out and, and learn how to use it. I think the new Sony games did a kind of great job of making it more accessible and, and so you, you know, stop banging against the wall so often and uh, <laughs> things like that. After leaving Spider-Man 3, Jamie went the indie route and developed his own game called Energy Hook, which builds on his web-swinging mechanics from Spider-Man 2. So if you're a fan of Jamie's work on that swinging system, I'd recommend checking out Energy Hook. I played it myself, and like with Spider-Man 2, as you start to master the mechanics, it becomes fun to just swing around and test your abilities with traversal. But going back to Spider-Man 3's traversal, we get to further explore our web-swinging abilities through one of the first missions called Mary Jane Thrill Ride. Admittedly, I didn't have high expectations going into this level, but I actually thought it was kind of cute. It starts with you meeting up with MJ on the roof to give her a lift to her destination. The twist is that your goal is to make her happy and have fun on the way, which is tied to your score. So for example, maybe she'll tell you that she wants to swing low to the ground, so the lower you swing, the more points you get, with points being hearts in this case. You can also swing through heart tokens to boost your score. I thought this was a really creative level that helps you master your swinging skills, but also used in a unique way that felt thematic to these characters. It's also just really sweet seeing Peter and MJ happy, and it sells their love for each other at this moment in the game. Their destination is a bridge in the park where Peter and MJ discuss Harry and how he still believes Peter killed his father. If it's been a while since you've seen Spider-Man 1, you'll recall that Harry's father, Norman, accidentally impaled himself with his own glider after trying to kill Peter with it. 
Peter brought Norman back to his home, but was seen briefly by Harry, leading Harry to believe that Peter killed his father. During Peter and MJ's conversation, we also see that the alien symbiote that crash landed on Earth is slowly climbing its way towards Peter. Also, I thought it was funny that Peter's shoes had the Treyarch logo on them, so a nice little detail there. But anyway, the symbiote landing on Earth via a meteor has become pretty commonplace in Venom's origin, but that's not how it happened in the comics. In the comics, the symbiote first appeared during the Secret Wars comic series when Peter accidentally comes in contact with it on a planet called Battleworld. After a battle, Peter and some of the other heroes with him needed their suits repaired. As Peter walks by the Hulk and Thor, they tell him that in the next room is a really cool machine that repairs your suit. When Peter goes into the next room to try it, he uses the wrong one, which contains the symbiote. This is how he gets the black suit, and since he went into the room initially for a suit repair, he just thinks that the machine accidentally gave him a black suit. It's not until he returns back to Earth that he eventually learns it's an alien, but we'll discuss that more as we get to it in the game. Meanwhile, we cut to Harry, who's in his father's secret goblin lair, and we see that Harry has gassed himself the same way that Norman did in the first movie to gain his strength. In the comics, Harry did a similar thing, dowsing himself in the goblin formula to get the strength to avenge his father by killing Spider-Man. We'll talk more about Harry's comic history compared to the movie later in the video, since I think it's pretty interesting, but before continuing on, I want to first take a moment and describe how I'll approach the game's narrative moving forward, since from here, Treyarch approached the story more loosely compared to the prior games. For Spider-Man 3's narrative, Treyarch had new ambitions and wanted to experiment. So this time, they aimed to give players more freedom when approaching story missions and the open world. Instead of missions unfolding one after another like in the prior games, Treyarch decided to place mission icons around the map so the player can see what missions are available and then freely choose the order in which they want to tackle them. The movie storyline forms the backbone of the game's narrative and is essentially the main story, but it kind of feels sprinkled in amongst the rest of the game. It honestly feels like this game is 90% side missions and 10% main quest, since you can play all the non-movie missions independently from each other and they don't really have a bearing on the main story. You'll also likely do a lot of bouncing around between different plot threads throughout the game, which I didn't mind, but for the video, I wanted things to feel a little bit more linear. So what we'll do is we'll start with the main movie narrative and follow it all the way through, while dabbling with some of the relevant side missions, and then afterwards, we'll double back and talk about each of the remaining side stories on their own. I'll also treat the lizard missions as part of the main story, since there's a part of it that does kind of tie into the main movie story. So let's pick up there with the first lizard mission. It begins with a recorded diary of Dr. Kirk Connors as he prepares to inject himself with an experimental serum to regrow his lost arm. After injecting himself, he starts to lash out violently, knocking his camera over. Fans of the comics will know that we just witnessed the birth of the lizard. In the comics, this is pretty much how things played out for Kirk Connors as well. After losing his arm, Kurt devoted his scientific research to lizards in hopes of replicating their ability to regrow lost limbs. After creating a serum, he tests it on himself, and at first it appears successful as his arm grows back. However, the transformation continues further, turning him into a humanoid lizard. As the lizard, Kurt Connors is in control, and the lizard acts of its own accord, with its goal being to repopulate the world full of lizards, which we'll see is his goal in the game too. Peter next comes face to face with the lizard when he goes to Dr. Connors' lab. The lizard spots him and flees into the sewers, so Peter changes into Spider-Man and follows him down. Once at the bottom, we find that there are already a bunch of lizard minions living in the sewers, and we'll have to fight our way through them to pursue lizard. Along the way, we'll of course encounter more quick time events, even just with swinging normally through the tunnels. I promise more fail clips, so here's what that looks like when you fail each one, as well as the final success. I guess Spider-Man's confidence issues from Spider-Man 2 are still prevalent since I think all of those involved his webbing not coming out. And yes, the final string of successes looked pretty cool, but still, I left that QTE thinking, why couldn't you just let me swing through the tunnels normally myself? Later in the mission, it does let you just swing normally through the tunnels, and it made me realize that even though my own swinging can be pretty sloppy at times, I'm having way more fun fumbling my way through here compared to when it's done masterfully through a QTE. There is, however, one QTE here that I didn't mind too much, and it's the surprise attack. That moment certainly caught me by surprise, and you're given a pretty short window to complete it, but if you're successful, it insta-kills that lizard brute. Compared to if you fail it, you now have to fight him like normal. I actually thought this was a fun use of a QTE, since failing it didn't force you to reset and try again, it's just a bonus if you get it. 
I bring this up because as much as I say I'm not a fan of quick time events, I don't think all of them are bad and when used sparingly, I think they can be effective. I think this is one of those cases since you're rewarded for quick reflexes, but if failed, the game progresses like normal. That being said, you'll see that QTEs in this game are severely overused and right after this moment, we're given another set to traverse this tunnel. I think you get the point. Continuing on, as we continue through the sewers, we also discover human citizens being captured to be turned into lizard minions. We need to stop Lizard fast before he converts more humans, and luckily we manage to track him down to the water purification room. In this room are three conveyor belts with grinders at the end, and we get a little mini boss fight here where we have to dodge Lizard and push him into the grinder. Also, I'm not sure if everyone's aware of this, but the Lizard can talk like a human, and we get to hear him speak in this level, which I think sounds pretty cool. How appropriate that you meet the end afforded all human waste. I will feed whatever's left of you to my brothers. That's no good. I'm really stringy. After slamming Lizard into the grinders, he'll become stunned, allowing you to perform a finisher on him via a QTE. If you miss one of the buttons, he'll damage you, either killing you if you don't have enough health, or forcing you to retry the QTE. When you complete it successfully, you'll throw Lizard into the next room, beginning the next phase of the fight. So to start, I thought this fight was pretty cool. I enjoyed fighting him hand-to-hand -hand while unleashing different combos against him, even if admittedly I didn't always plan ahead with specific combos. We'll talk about it more later, but another issue this game has is that it can easily become very button mashy. However, in this case, I still enjoyed the combat of this lizard fight. This section also attempts to test our skills with spider reflexes, so let's talk about that mechanic a bit. Spider reflexes are this game's dodge mechanic, and basically what you would think of as spider sense in most cases. However, Spider Sense belongs to a different mechanic in this game, where when triggered, it turns your vision gray and highlights points of interest in the area. So Spider Sense is essentially detective mode from the Arkham games, although Spider-Man 3 came out first. But going back to Spider Reflexes, the way it works is that an enemy will initiate an attack against you, and a yellow indicator will pop up over their head. You're meant to hit the Spider Reflex button to auto-dodge the attack, or hold the Reflex button for an extended time to auto-dodge all incoming attacks at once. One of the tutorial boxes during this fight recommends you do so as well. I was getting multiple spider reflex tutorial hints during this fight, so I took it to be somewhat of an advanced tutorial. For that reason though, I felt like it was a bit counterintuitive that the lizard uses an undodgeable attack here. You can't use spider reflexes against it, and the hint box tells you to take a few steps back instead. It's a charge attack, so I didn't find taking steps backward to be too effective as a quick response, and I usually opted to try and jump off of the lizard instead, since there's not an evade mechanic. So I had a couple issues here. The first is that I didn't think the hint was very useful since jumping seemed to be the best response. That sounds like a minor nitpick here, I know, but I think it speaks to a larger issue with how the game fails to teach you important information, which we'll discuss more throughout the video. The other issue I have is that I would have liked a more reliable way to counter this undodgeable attack. I don't mind an undodgeable attack as a general gameplay mechanic, but if it's going to be there, I think there needs to be an equally effective mechanic for the player to counter it with, like having the ability to block specific attacks, or maybe web Lizard before he can get the attack off, or as another example, the dodge mechanic in the PS2 version. It's an evasive maneuver where you dive away from incoming attacks, or towards an enemy allowing you to vault over them, while also giving you a moment to hit them in the process. I would have liked this dive ability in the PS3 version, not only against Lizard and his undodgeable attacks, but also because I like its ability to create some quick distance from an enemy, something I wanted at various points in Treyarch's version. So there are different mechanics I'm craving at this point in the game, and I think this early level introduces us to some deeper rooted problems that we'll see throughout the rest of the game. But overall, I still thought this boss fight was pretty decent, and it was fun fighting Lizard. And despite my complaints, I am really appreciative that we finally have Lizard in the Raimi Spider-Man universe somewhere. Dr. Connors was in both Spider-Man 2 and 3, and I was always hoping to see his character build up to the point of becoming Lizard, but we never got there. Also, the Lizard was a planned villain for the Spider-Man 2 game, but had to be cut for time. You can even find some of his Lizard minions used in its arena mode. So after being so close yet so far with Lizard, I am really glad that he was included here. And after doing enough damage to him, he'll make an escape to the surface, and we'll have to do another series of quick time events to stop him. We managed to prevent Lizard from escaping to the surface, but we also accidentally caused him to fall and crash to the floor, deeper into the sewer. Spider-Man won't continue after him yet, and we'll instead revisit the Lizard at a later point in the game. Continuing on though, we're going to jump ahead a bit to the next movie mission, which is when we're jumped by the new goblin. Peter's walking through the city when he's suddenly confronted by Harry. After executing a poorly timed backflip, Peter's abducted by Harry Osborn, the new goblin. 
In an attempt to match the cinematics of the movie, we're given a sequence of quick time events to fight Harry on his glider, or as the movie calls it, the sky stick. In a behind the scenes interview for the game, actor James Franco actually discusses New Goblin's arsenal as well as the sky stick, and it seems he wasn't completely on board with the design. New Goblin is practical. His only desire is to kill Spider-Man. It's not like he's going to design a suit that is going to strike terror in, to the citizens of New York. He just wants something that is going to get the job done. And he's designed you know, the sword to cut the webs and the pumpkin bombs, and it's very utilitarian. As far as the board, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't have any. Uh, I didn't have any say in that. I suppose it appeals to the to the youth. It's not your daddy's sky stick. As far as the fight in the game, more button prompts are of course frustrating, but at the very least, it does look cool fighting Harry on the sky stick. I mean, Peter's animations look a bit like he's at the club, but for the most part, I thought the sequence looked very cinematic, especially since the fight is taking place all across the city. Once you successfully complete this series of QTEs, Peter will jump off the sky stick and you're free to roam around the city while Harry pursues. I actually thought this next sequence was the best part and a really awesome idea, since it's essentially a free roam boss fight. You can swing all around the city and wherever you stop is where Goblin will fight you. I thought this was an excellent way to replicate the Harry and Peter fight from the movie, which was probably my favorite fight sequence in the film. I liked how high flying it was and that it moved from place to place across the city. The game captures that freedom and I'd say this is probably my favorite boss fight in it. Harry can still be a challenging fight though since he can do a lot of damage very quickly and he's also a bit of a damage sponge, so there's very little margin for error on your end. That was fun. This fight was also made more challenging by the lack of a lock-on feature. Spider-Man 2 had a lock-on button, but for the life of me, I can't find one in Spider-Man 3. I don't think it's a feature the player can trigger in this game, which if true, seems really odd, but I searched the settings and button lists and I couldn't find one. So that added some frustration to the fight since it can be tough to keep track of Harry on his glider. Around this time is also when I started to realize that I'm not really enjoying the spider reflexes mechanic. Like I sort of alluded to earlier, this isn't like the spider sense mechanic in Spider-Man PS4 where you dodge incoming attacks individually by pressing the dodge button each time you want to dodge an attack. In Spider-Man 3, you'll instead hold the button down, putting things in slow motion to auto dodge all incoming attacks as they happen. You'll want to do this often since you'll encounter fights where multiple enemies are attacking at once, or enemies will have a few rapid attacks that you need to dodge all in a row. Despite there being attack indicators that pop up, you're not given much reaction time for them, so trying to dodge them individually isn't really effective, which is why you need to hold the button down. My problem is that you only have limited spider reflexes, as indicated by this blue meter. It depletes pretty quickly, and during high intensity fights, you don't have much flexibility in juggling that meter. Most of the time, you just have to hold it and hope that you can outlast a swarm of attacks. If your meter runs out, you're left defenseless while it recharges. I didn't realize until later reviewing these clips, since the game doesn't tell you, but the meter depletes faster when you successfully dodge an attack, so if you dodge a chain of them, you can lose meter pretty fast. I guess the developers were nervous that spider reflexes would be abused otherwise, but this inconsistent depletion made it difficult to gauge how much I was using moment to moment and how much I had left, and trying to constantly monitor that tiny meter in the corner while also trying to focus on these high intensity fights wasn't practical. I think part of the issue is how little warning you're given for an incoming attack. Since you're not given a lot of time to react, the result is that you don't just hold down spider reflexes for attacks as they happen, but also earlier in anticipation of attacks that might happen, since you likely won't have time to dodge before the attack lands. So with this Harry fight, I felt like I needed spider reflexes active almost constantly because he would attack very suddenly and deal a lot of damage if I wasn't careful. So as much as I'm loving the thematics of this boss fight, the gameplay itself was a bit tedious as I'm juggling spider reflexes and trying to spam damage on Harry as much as I can in that window. I think this could have been mitigated though had some small changes been made, like reducing Harry's health to be less spongy or increasing the amount of warning time you get prior to an enemy attack. A subtle change that would help greatly with spider reflexes is just including these spider sense waves that appear over Spidey's head prior to an attack. Although minor and seemingly inconsequential, this is a very effective tool for the player since it appears on Spider-Man and at the center of the screen where the player is looking most often, so the player is immediately aware of potential attacks without having to scan the rest of the screen. Strangely, this mechanic was in Treyarch's Spider-Man 2 game, but removed for the third. It was really helpful in the second game though, for the reasons I mentioned, but I like that it also had an audio cue that would chime alongside your spider sense. The audio cue was nice because you become like Pavlov's dog but with incoming attacks, since you knew to react based on that chime alone. So my point is that these two minor features help to quickly inform the player of incoming attacks without needing to adjust their focus from the center of the screen. 
As it stands in the third game, the visual spider sense indicator was removed, as well as the audio cue that would accompany it, both of which would have been very useful tools in this game, and I'm feeling their absence. But anyway, once you've dealt enough damage to Harry, you're in for another quick time event. In this one, you use Harry's razor bats against him as a distraction while you set up some webs to clothesline him. From here, Peter rushes his friend to the hospital, and we won't really see Harry again until the end of the game, but in the movie, this is where he suffers amnesia from his head injury. This isn't too far off from the comics either, so let's discuss how the film's Harry Osborn relates to the comics. So in the comics, Harry does become the goblin after his father's death. Like in the film, Harry knows that Norman died during a fight with Spider-Man, and believes that Spider-Man killed Norman. To get revenge, he dons the same green goblin outfit and gear that his father used. So the snowboarder design is an original look for the movie, and Harry isn't known as the new goblin in the comics, he just goes by Green Goblin. Harry suffered amnesia a couple times as the goblin too. The first time was after being defeated by Spider-Man, Harry's last gambit was to snitch by telling medics and law enforcement that Peter Parker's Spider-Man and that he's the Green Goblin. They of course thought he was crazy, so Harry was sent to an asylum. While there, he saw a psychiatrist named Bart Hamilton. Through their sessions, Bart learned that Harry was telling the truth about being the Goblin, so he placed Harry under hypnotic regression, so he would essentially forget about being the Goblin. Bart did this so he could use the information he learned from Harry to find all the Goblin equipment and become the Goblin himself. Harry later learned what Bart Hamilton did to him, and confronted him dressed as the Green Goblin for a final showdown. During their fight, Bart managed to land a hit on Harry, knocking him out and giving him amnesia. Bart still managed to die during this fight though, when he activated a remote bomb to use against Spider-Man. Bart didn't realize that he was standing on a conveyor belt, and he fell off the edge with the bomb as it exploded. From here though, Harry's amnesia regressed him back to being a friend of Peter's, similar to the movie. This wouldn't last long though, as Harry would later regain his memories and plot revenge against Peter once again, but we'll get into how that plays out in the comics when we get to that point in the game's narrative. For now, we'll skip ahead to our first encounter with Sandman. Prior to triggering it, we get to walk around Peter's apartment for a bit, and it's a nice recreation from the film. We can also see that Peter has more Treyarch gear than just shoes, since he also has a shirt with the logo. When we triggered the actual mission, we're given a cutscene that's very similar to the movie, but I'll let you watch it and then we'll discuss it. I can't, I can't. Let him get away. So as you can see, certain story elements from the movie are being condensed down from the game. In the film, there was a whole retcon reveal that it was actually Sandman who murdered Uncle Ben and that Peter wanted revenge when he found out, and that's why Spider-Man tracked down Sandman. That's not in the game at all, and Sandman is just another guy robbing banks at this moment when Spider-Man notices him running into the subway station. So I found it a little odd that Peter was still mumbling in his sleep about a murderer and not letting him get away, since in the movie, Peter is having nightmares of Sandman killing Uncle Ben. By the way, if you're wondering if Sandman killing Uncle Ben is from the comics, it's not, and that was a decision made for the movie. Sandman's comic origin is pretty similar though, since he started out as an escaped inmate on the run from the police. He chose to hide out on the beach of an atomic devices testing center at the same time they conducted a nuclear test explosion. Flint was caught in the blast, and his body merged with the molecules of sand, turning him into Sandman. But before discussing more about Sandman, let's talk about the symbiote suit latching onto Peter. The game's cutscene follows the movie scenes pretty closely, but those are also very reminiscent of moments from the comics. To begin, there are multiple instances of the symbiote slinking towards Peter while he's asleep in his apartment. It's super creepy, so I'm glad they kept that element in the film. It was later revealed that what the symbiote would do at night is bond itself to Peter in his sleep, and then take his body on joy rides around the city. Peter was never awake for any of this, and for the rest of the day, he'd be confused as to why he felt so exhausted after a full night's rest. During his sleep, his attachment to the symbiote would also give him bad nightmares, so the game and movie showing Peter experiencing nightmares is pretty accurate too. In the movie, there's also the famous shot of Peter waking up to his reflection in a building window, which is his first time seeing himself in the black suit. This actually isn't from the comics, 
but instead it's nearly identical to a scene from the 90s Spider-Man animated series. So it's cool that Sam Raimi pulled inspiration from multiple mediums and not just the comics. Going back to the game, Black Suit Spider-Man follows Sandman down into the train station and confronts him. Again, nothing is mentioned about Uncle Ben like in the movies, this is just a rage-filled Spider-Man stopping a superpowered bank robber. The game still replicates moments from the movie though, like Spider-Man using the train to do a powerful web-zip kick into Sandman, or grabbing Sandman's face and grinding it against an oncoming train. This fight is also our first time using the Black Suit and its rage mechanic. To use it, you have to fill up the suit's rage meter, as indicated by the purple substance between the health and reflex meters. To trigger it, you can't just press a button though, you of course have to spam R1, I guess to simulate rage? I'm not sure, but I'm mentioning it so you get a better idea of just how much button spamming is in this game, because it's everywhere. But once you trigger it, Spider-Man will go into a rage, indicated by the red aura around him. In rage mode, his attacks do more damage, since Spider-Man's strength is enhanced by the symbiote. Overall, I thought this was a pretty fun mission, and Sandman is enjoyable to battle. It's satisfying hitting him and seeing shards of sand fly off, and I also thought it was fun that Sandman can get hit by the train, which briefly turns him into a cloud of sand until he rematerializes to continue the fight. If Spider-Man gets hit by the train though, he'll get sent ragdolling across the map, which is pretty funny. But as for the fight itself, I think it's a fun one and I think the developers did a good job of making it feel as thematic as the one in the movie. At least as far as the general gameplay of the fight goes, since it still relies too much on QTEs. The way this fight is structured is that you'll fight Sandman on top of the train tracks until you've done enough damage to him. At that point, you'll be given a series of button prompts to cinematically transition the fight to the next phase. However, if you miss a button press, Sandman will instead damage you and you'll return to the same train tracks to resume the fight and try the QTE again. By the way, I tried failing a lot of these QTEs, and I thought this one was pretty funny. If you succeed in these series of button prompts, the fight will now progress on a lower level of the train tracks, where you pretty much do the same thing again, but with a different cinematic quick time event at the end. Again, if you miss one of the prompts, Sandman will damage you, and you'll have to fight him some more and retry the QTE. Completing this next series of button prompts will take you and Sandman down to the bottom level, like in the movie. There, you'll mash more buttons to open up a drainage pipe to douse Sandman in water. In the film, Peter believes Sandman to be dead, but the game offers no commentary, it's just a mission complete. But overall, despite all the QTEs, I thought this was a fun boss fight. Sandman doesn't feel as damage spongy as the other bosses, and I really love the trains coming and going. It makes the environment feel more lively and interactive, and added a fun layer besides just pummeling Sandman. I also like that we could replicate certain moments from the movie, like smashing Sandman's face into the train. But even that moment was kind of diluted by the button prompts. That one in particular was odd too, because the buttons alternate as you're mashing. I'm not sure why, I guess to simulate the struggle of holding Sandman down, but it was more frustrating than fun. It also took away from the moment, because instead of watching this cool scene, my eyes are glued to the buttons so I'll know when they change. So as the player, I'm not even getting to enjoy this badass move I'm pulling off, since my focus has to be on the on-screen buttons. But after our battle with Sandman, we're introduced to two more villains atop a building. That insect is somewhere in this city, Calypso. A hunter can sense when his prey is near. The next time you meet Spider-Man, you will destroy him, my love. But now you must focus on the reason you came here. Your greatest trophy awaits. And when you bring these creatures down, your name will live in glory forever! <laughs> Let the hunt begin. This is of course Craven and Calypso. I was able to chat a bit with writer Matt Rhodes, and he mentioned that this Craven and Calypso story, as well as how it ties in with Lizard, was originally going to be in Spider-Man 2 as part of the underground sewer area that was cut. Interestingly, Calypso is still present in the Spider-Man 2 game since she was recycled into a boss fight in its arena mode. In the comics, Calypso is a voodoo priestess and supportive girlfriend to Kraven, the master hunter who's always seeking to challenge himself with the biggest and baddest prey he can find. In this case, he's after the lizard. That takes us into the next lizard mission as we return back to the sewer to track down Lizard. When we arrive, we find a bunch of his minions impaled by spears. As we continue through the sewers, we find we're not far behind Kraven at all. When we catch up, we find Kraven standing over the body of the lizard with Calypso behind him. Before Kraven can make the killing blow, Spider-Man intervenes. With this distraction, Lizard is able to escape and Calypso chooses to pursue him. This leaves Spider-Man and Kraven alone to duke it out one on one. You may recall that this isn't the first time Kraven and Spider-Man have fought in this game's universe. The first time was during the Spider-Man 1 movie game as part of an exclusive level for Xbox. 
In it, Norman Osborn calls Kraven to kill Spider-Man, which he agrees to do for the thrill of the hunt. The showdown takes place at the zoo, where the two fight. Spider-Man ultimately wins and leaves Kraven for the police. It seems Kraven has since returned, and this is his opportunity to finally defeat Spider-Man. I also thought it was cool that this fight occurs while Spider-Man is wearing his black suit, mostly because it's giving me flashbacks to Kraven's most famous comic storyline, Kraven's Last Hunt, where Spider-Man was also in the black suit, although it was the cloth version and not the alien symbiote. It's a good story too, so I won't spoil it here in case anyone would like to check it out for themselves. But as for this fight, it starts off simple enough as pretty much just a normal slugfest. As you damage Kraven, he'll start to throw some different abilities your way, like creating clones of himself as distractions, or taking potions to grant himself animal-like abilities. For example, the first potion makes him strong like a bear, the second potion allows him to fly like a vulture, and the third potion makes him quick like a panther. This is similar to the comics, where Kraven also augments his strength through potions. Also, I should mention that I saw the Kraven movie trailer where his power seems to come from lion's blood, and that's not the case in the comics, in case anyone was wondering. Going back to the boss fight though, I liked this one a lot and thought it was well designed. There was a good challenge progression, and I liked the variety it had within it. Each potion Kraven took forced me to adapt my playstyle a bit to properly account for Kraven's new abilities, so I thought this was really solid. This is really only the warm-up though, since Kraven flees into another room after this battle, where we're in for a more intense final showdown against him. Here, Kraven takes another potion, this one giving him the ability to turn invisible. Not only that, but lizard minions will also fight against us while we try to focus on Kraven. After that last fight, I was excited to get an opportunity to fight Kraven some more, but I was really disappointed with this next phase, since it felt like another boss fight that really needed some additional fine-tuning. So to start, I think the premise is good. Kraven is camouflaged, and we have to get close to him to reveal his position. Spider-Sense doesn't reveal him, and despite this being a water arena, his footsteps weren't a reliable way to track him either, so I found that I had to run around until I got close enough to decloak him. This I don't mind, as it creates some good tension since you never know how close or far he is from you, and you definitely feel like prey being hunted. My issue is again more so with spider reflexes. Kraven can attack very quickly and with little notification, so I felt like I had to run around with spider reflexes active often to get that slowdown effect to allow me to find Kraven, as well as dodge any opening attacks he may have. He has combo attacks of his own that he'll use against you too, and mixing that with the lizards and their ranged attacks, you can see that spider reflexes needs to be up constantly. So it was very easy for the reflex meter to drain, leaving you vulnerable, and I found that trying to juggle the meter was the biggest challenge of this fight, more so than Kraven. But Kraven is still a challenge in his own right too, and I found this level to be a pretty steep ramp in difficulty. In fact, I'd say this is the hardest level in the game. Kraven's not only a damage sponge, but he can also do a lot of dodging and blocking. To counter this, you need to be in rage mode to effectively break that defense and deal some damage. This is why there are endless waves of lizard minions that will enter the arena, so you can use them to build up the rage meter and unleash it on Kraven. So I felt like I had to follow a repetitive cycle of using the lizards to build rage meter, then find Kraven, then fight for as long as I had enough meter, and then rinse and repeat. So not only was it a tough fight, but it also felt tedious, stale, and prolonged, and this ended up being my least favorite boss fight in the game, which is such a shame because that first Kraven fight was so creative and fun. But after dealing enough damage to Kraven, their fight is interrupted when they hear Calypso and Lizard. We then see that Calypso has cornered Lizard and done something to him before the camera cuts away. Kraven then decides to disappear and flee once again, suggesting that Spider-Man go check out what Calypso has done. When we head into the next room, we find that Calypso has turned him into a giant monster lizard that we now have to deal with. Before getting into the fight, I thought this was somewhat thematic to the comics, mainly the Torment storyline where Calypso uses her abilities to puppet lizard to do her bidding, turning him into a murderous monster. So not exactly the same, but pretty similar. In the game, Lizard also now has an energy shield around him, so we can't damage him directly. What we have to do is grab him by his tail and then throw him into the four generators scattered around the room, kind of reminiscent of the Bowser fight in Super Mario 64. But anyway, this explosion weakens his shield and after throwing him into all four of them, he'll be vulnerable for an attack. He'll then start leaping around the room before dive bombing you. If you can evade it successfully, you'll be able to damage him like normal. After doing this a few times, you're in for another quick time event where you attempt to subdue Lizard. Peter does too good of a job though, knocking him through the wall and onto some train tracks, electrocuting him. Peter thinks he's killed him, but Lizard then reverts back to Kirk Connors. Still, Peter is concerned at what he's done. I'm sorry, Doc. Your nightmare's over. But what's happening to me? Later, Peter returns back to the Daily Bugle, where he finds Eddie Brock. Jameson is offered a staff job to whoever can get a picture of Spider-Man committing a crime, and Eddie's determined he's going to get it. Peter's suspicious of his tactics, so he decides to follow him as Spider-Man. Outside of the Daily Bugle, we see what Eddie's planning. You ready to do this? 
I guess. Are you sure about this, Eddie? I've been thinking. Don't think. I'm paying you, and no one's gonna get hurt. It's just a picture. Now chill. Give me your best Spidey pose. I thought it was interesting that in a behind the scenes video, we can see that they had the imposter in a different outfit at one point. Regardless, Peter is pretty upset that Eddie is attempting to fake the photo, so he decides to confront them. His method of choice is by dropping in and punching Eddie and then taking his camera. I guess we can chalk this up to the black suit making him impulsive and aggressive, but this was overall a pretty dumb way to do things, which Eddie points out afterward. Oh, you think you're smart, buddy? Well, think again. I hit a bunch of cameras around here, and now I have an even better shot than I was planning. You punching me in the jaw and taking my camera. So thanks. This leads to a mission where we have to take down all of Eddie's cameras that he has set up in the area. I don't know why he had so many set up for that fake photo shoot or why he has the budget for this many cameras or how he managed to set them up on these sides of buildings as if he has spider powers of his own, but I'll go with it. And after we take down all the cameras, Brock vows revenge on Spider-Man. Nice going, Spidey. Pinning something on you just moved to the top of my list. How I get something on you if it's the last thing I do. I thought the PS2 version approached this fake bugle photo in a strange way too. It begins with Peter actually deciding to fake a photo himself by first setting up cameras along a street. He then changes to the black suit and seeks out a citizen willing to let him swing them down the street, but with the intention of scaring them a bit for the sake of the photo. Afterward, Peter hears about a mugging involving Spider-Man down the street, so he goes to investigate. When we arrive, we find a fake Spider-Man attempting to mug a guy. So, with one punch, we deck the fake Spider-Man and learn that it's actually Eddie Brock in the suit. As far as this mission goes, I think they could have skipped the part where Peter scares a civilian for a picture and instead just have us catch Eddie in the act, since it feels weird to have Peter staging a photo to paint Spider-Man in a bad light, and the act doesn't serve any purpose to the narrative anyway. Regardless, we next tell Jonah what we've learned, and while he's firing Eddie, I thought this line was funny. And that costume! Ridiculous! If you're gonna commit fraud, don't cut corners. He would know based on his time dressing in Spider-Man's costume during a deleted scene from Spider-Man 2. But anyway, this takes us into our next mission involving the villain Kingpin. It starts at the Daily Bugle where we get our best taste of what Bully Maguire acts like in the game. Hey, Betty. Looking good. Thanks, Pete. No, seriously, I would definitely... I think Mr. Jameson had a job for you. Why don't you go in and see him? <laughs> You're lost, babe. What's up, JJ? Get over to the courthouse. The chief of police is holding a press conference. And get your feet off my desk. What's the magic word? Now! I was thinking please, but whatever. Like Jameson asked, we head to the courtroom where a press conference is being given, showing the various gang leaders in custody by the police. We took each of them down earlier in the game, but I'll discuss them more later in the video. For now, we exit the courtroom and find Wilson Fisk, the kingpin of crime, waiting outside. He soon gives the order to various gang members to break their leaders free. They do as they're told, so we spend the rest of this mission fighting all the different gangs at once to settle things down. After this, we break into Kingpin's home to subdue him. The place is full of henchmen though, so we'll have to fight our way through them to get to him. If you'll allow me to get ahead of myself a bit, I actually really love this level. The interiors look great, and I love how destructible it all is. It goes perfectly with the rage of the black suit. I also love that during this fight, classical music is playing in the background, which feels very thematic to Kingpin. Eventually, we make our way to Fisk and fight him in this hallway. It's pretty awesome getting to fight Kingpin, and I thought this was an enjoyable boss battle. Kingpin feels powerful, but not over the top like some of the earlier boss fights. You're meant to lean into your rage mode again, since Kingpin can block your attacks pretty easily. Once you're in rage mode, you can really start to beat him and throw him around like he's nothing, which was pretty fun too. Afterwards though, the following cutscene does commit one of my gaming pet peeves, where even though I felt like I really put the beating on Fisk, the next cutscene shows Spider-Man getting absolutely wrecked by him. On the plus side, it effectively displays just how powerful Fisk is, but I wish something like that occurred before the boss fight. Continuing on, Fisk brought us into this room on purpose, since it's where all the gang leaders are waiting for us. 
They want revenge for locking them up, so we have to fight them all at once right now. I thought this was a really cool fight and a nice way to cap off the gang missions we've been doing earlier in the game. Being able to handle them all at once also served as a good showcase of our power now that we're more leveled up in our black suit. After defeating them all, we get our final showdown with Kingpin. This fight is a lot like the earlier one, but it's still fun fighting one-on-one -on -one against Fisk in the black suit. At the end of it, we're given a flurry of quick time events as Spider-Man pummels Fisk before he just launches him out the window. What did I do? I didn't mean to throw him that hard. No sign of him. Could he have survived that fall? Well, I'm done here either way. I love how Spider-Man keeps accidentally nearly killing villains, and it's just kind of like, oops. Regardless, I thought this was an excellent level. It was well designed, it felt unique from the other ones, and had some good surprises within it. It also was a good display of the black suit's power and fury, so I think it was effective thematically as well. Next, we get to see more of Bully Maguire, and how the suit is affecting his relationship with MJ. You've hardly said three words all night. Is everything all right? I figured you were talking enough for both of us. Peter, what's gotten into you lately? Nothing that's stopping your gums from flapping wouldn't solve. I think you should take me home. Now. Mary Jane, I... Now, Peter. Yeah, the symbiote makes Peter kind of a dick in this game. And as a twist on these sweet, wholesome MJ thrill ride missions earlier, this next mission flips things upside down as Peter does things to intentionally bother MJ on the swing home, and he's just straight up mean to her. Here are some of the comments between them. This is too scary! What's wrong? Can't you handle this? You're heading the wrong way! Are you going to complain about every little thing? I think I'm gonna be sick. I need a girl who can keep up with me. When they get to the destination, MJ's pissed, and Peter's body language almost seems like he's on the verge of being abusive. You're hurting me, Peter! Let go! MJ, I... I'm sorry, I, I... I don't know what came over me. Neither do I, but until you work it out, I don't want to see you. Are you... breaking up with me? I'm sorry, Peter. I just can't be with you right now. Now that MJ's broken up with him, Peter realizes he needs to ditch the black suit. This matches the movie, where it's the moment that Peter knocks MJ down that convinces him he needs to make a change. Initially, I thought that nearly killing Lizard and Kingpin should have brought him to that realization, but I think the idea is that Peter intends to hurt those villains, so he might under-evaluate those moments he oversteps with them. Compared to MJ, someone he loves and has no intention of hurting, yet he's getting worse with her too. So I think the realization makes sense on that personal level. Still, I do think the decision to ditch the suit felt a bit abrupt in the Treyarch game, but I think it's smoother in the PS2 version since there's more build-up. So let's rewind a bit and look at how Vicarious Visions approaches the story. So to start, you're given the symbiote way earlier in the game, and it's right after you beat New Goblin. You're then dropped into the city with it, where you'll test it out by fighting gang members. One thing I like is that the suit's gameplay ties directly into the idea that the suit is bad for you, despite its strength. While you're wearing it, your strength will increase, but over time, you'll see an aura around the screen start to darken. This indicates that if you wear the suit for too long, you'll pass out and fail your current mission. To counter that, you have to decide to suppress the symbiote suit and go back to your normal red suit, which you'll do via a mini QTE. So yeah, in the PS2 version, you can switch between the black and red suit at will, which is really awesome. This felt great strategically because you can choose to equip the black suit when you're in a tough combat encounter. What's brilliant to me about it though, is that the suit is so strong that it can be tough to decide when to remove it. It'll go on a cooldown afterwards, so you want to get the most out of it while you can. I thought this was great thematically because it simulates for the player Peter's struggle and addiction to the power of the symbiote suit. You never want to remove it, but you know you have to after a while. On a side note, one detail I thought was funny too is if you try to upgrade your abilities while wearing the black suit, you'll get a message saying, Upgrades cannot be purchased while in the black suit. What, the black suit isn't good enough for you? So I think that further emphasizes the power of the suit in this version. But like I was saying, the build up to Peter ditching the suit felt smoother too. There's still the moment where Peter questions things after nearly killing Lizard, but it goes beyond that and actually ties in a bit to that exclusive Morbius level, so we'll talk about that next. After defeating Giant Lizard, Spider-Man returns to Dr. Connor's lab to ask him to examine a sample of the symbiote for him. Connors agrees, since he feels that he owes his life to Spider-Man for helping him out of his lizard form earlier, which is a bit ironic since Peter thought he killed him. While we wait for his results, we head back to the Daily Bugle. 
There, Jameson shows us a headline about vampires at the ESU campus and tells Peter to go get vampire photos. By the way, is it just me or does Peter's face look way better in the PS2 version? Anyway, Peter goes to ESU and spots Morbius the Living Vampire as he attempts to slink away from the daylight. While Peter attempts to get photos, Morbius jumps into view and smacks the camera out of his hands. Peter goes after the camera and manages to catch it in time to save the photo of Morbius. Also, I really love how creepy they made Morbius look in this game, and I think they did a great job on his design. But afterwards, Peter returns back to Connor's lab to see what he's learned about the symbiote. Unfortunately, Connors hasn't been able to turn up any new info. Kurt calls it a night, and Peter stays at the lab to investigate for himself. This is also when we get an unintentionally hilarious angry Spider-Man cutscene. Hello? MJ? What do you want? No, I haven't found out anything. Don't call back! Tests and nothing! Oh my god! He's a vampire! You've ticked me off on the wrong night, Count. Spider Man then finds Morbius on a roof, and this leads into a boss fight against him. It's actually a pretty unique one, and not just a straight up slugfest. Morbius is too powerful at night, so we can't damage him. Instead, we have to distract him until daytime, which we do by making web barriers between these vents. When Morbius charges at us, we dodge out of the way, and he gets stuck in the web temporarily. After doing this for a while, the sun comes up, and we're able to finally beat up Morbius. Eventually, the sunlight becomes too much for him. The sun, it'll kill me. <gasps> Either this guy's a real vampire, or the best method actor I've ever seen. I thought that comment from Spider-Man was hilarious in hindsight, because in the Morbius movie, Morbius is played by Jared Leto, one of the most notorious method actors in Hollywood. But anyway, Spider-Man brings Morbius back to Dr. Connor's lab for examination. Surprisingly, Kurt actually knows Michael Morbius, since Michael is a world-renowned geneticist. Morbius wakes up and recognizes Kurt too, and begs him for help with his condition. Kurt Connors, please help. Something's wrong with me. I. I don't know what. It comes over me at night, like this force I, I can't control. I know it sounds crazy. I understand. Better than you know. We both do. I really like that Vicarious Visions chose to use these three characters together here. They've all been dealing with a darkness inside them, turning them into a monster, so they can empathize with each other's struggles, and I like that parallel between them. They've also interacted as a trio in the comics before, too. During a comic where Spider-Man attempted to remove his spider powers, he actually boosted them, causing him to become more spider-like by growing additional arms. He went to seek out Kurt for help, and Morbius just so happened to show up at the same time. Kurt turns into the lizard, and all three start to fight. Kurt then gets bit by Morbius, but the bite contained an enzyme that starts to turn Kurt normal. They realize this could be a solution to Spider-Man's extra limb problems, so they draw blood from Morbius to create a serum. Spider-Man later uses the serum, and it successfully regresses his additional arms. It's a pretty fun story, and I like seeing these three characters together, so I'm enjoying it in the game as well. Morbius reveals something interesting to them here too, and it's that he was changed by his wife, Francis, and that she's gone through a change too. He speculates that she may have the answer to a cure. With this information, we track down Francis, otherwise known as Shriek. Mrs. Morbius, I presume? Get lost, you creepy crawly! I don't like strangers around when my kids are out playing! The people she refers to as her kids are random people she has under her control to wreak havoc on the city. It's not exactly clear what the origins of her powers are in this game, but it seems to stem from the symbiote meteorite. Shriek ends up fleeing from us during this level, so we have to come up with a new plan. After tracking down her hideout, we decide it's best to bring Morbius to her in hopes of convincing her to cure him, so we carry Morbius and swing him all the way to her hideout. Once there, Morbius and Shriek talk, and we hear a bit about their origins. What did you do to me? I never meant to hurt you, my darling. I released the blood pathogens you were researching in your lab. They must have poisoned your system. But I can make you stronger again, my love. Stronger than ever. With my loyal followers, the family we wanted is finally ours. Together, we can have everything we desire, and more, and no one can stop us. So let's take a moment to discuss their origins in the comics, because they're quite different from the game. 
To start, Morbius and Shriek aren't in a relationship in the comics. However, this relationship seems to be slightly based off the Maximum Carnage storyline, where it's Shriek and Carnage who are an item. They meet in the Ravencroft Insane Asylum when Carnage is killing his way through it to break free. Shriek is cheering him on from her cell, and their mutual bloodlust makes them instantly attracted to each other. Carnage brings Shriek along with him, and the two begin killing their way across the city. Over time, they invite more villains to join them, like Doppelganger, Demo Goblin, and Carrion, all of which Shriek refers to as their kids, with Shriek and Carnage being the parents. So this is why Shriek refers to her minions as kids in the game. Shriek's powers are pretty similar to the game too, although the origins of them differ. Unlike the game, her powers aren't due to a symbiote, since Shriek is instead a mutant whose powers emerged when she was apprehended by the hero Cloak and trapped within his Dark Dimension. This drove her insane, but also gave her the ability to manipulate sound. This allows her to produce sonic blasts, and she's also able to bring the darkness inside people to the forefront. For example, she used this ability in Maximum Carnage to turn the citizens of the city against themselves, as well as against the heroes she was fighting. Morbius was in the Maximum Carnage series as well, but he was on the opposing side of Shriek. Speaking of Morbius, his origins are much different in the comics too. In those, he suffered from a rare blood disease and desperately tried to find a way to cure himself. He experimented with vampire bats and developed a serum that he hoped would cure him. As these experiments tend to go in the comics, it doesn't work as planned and it instead turns Morbius into a living vampire. So the game takes a lot of liberties with the origins of these characters, but for the most part, stays true to their powers and personalities. But now we have to fight them both together since Morbius is under Shriek's control. We'll focus on taking him off the board first by taking advantage of his weakness to sunlight. After luring him into the light, he'll be left vulnerable for us to damage him. To heal him back up, Shriek has to sacrifice some of her power, so we repeat this process to weaken her. After doing this enough, Shriek loses her energy shield and flees into the next room. As we chase after her, we start to see visions of MJ as she calls for our help. When we enter the room, we're faced with hallucinations of MJ, Harry, Jonah, and Kirk Connors trying to fight us, while also tormenting us with their words. I always wanted my father's life. Are you prepared to give me his death? You're a disappointment, Peter, in every sense of the word. This isn't real. It can't be. I liked this moment a lot since it showcases Peter's inner doubts and concerns and makes him physically confront them. Also, it's a lot of fun wailing on Jonah, although it's equally strange watching him do high kicks. To counter these hallucinations though, we have to switch to our symbiote suit, which is immune to Shriek's tricks. This reveals that we're really fighting her and her minions and also allows us the freedom to directly damage her. After defeating her, she has a change of heart and decides to cure Morbius of his vampirism. However, Shriek is still suffering so we take her to Dr. Connors for treatment. We leave her here, and that ends the Morbius and Shriek exclusive levels. Overall, I thought these were really cool levels, and I wish they had made it into the Treyarch versions. Not only because they're fun characters and I like their story, but also because they do a good job of highlighting Peter's struggles with the symbiote and his inner darkness. I thought they helped a lot in selling Peter's acknowledgement that the suit is bad for him and why he should give it up. This is further emphasized in the Sandman level that takes place after these missions, and I like how Vicarious Visions approached it in comparison to Treyarch. In the PS2 version, we see Peter leaving the subway, and as he's walking, he passes by some cops discussing Spider-Man in his black suit. They mention that ever since Spider-Man switched to the black suit, he's been putting more people in the hospital and has been more trouble overall. Peter overhears this and decides he should ditch the black suit for a bit. This is when Sandman shows up to rob them, and Peter swings into action to stop him. So this version of the Sandman train fight deviates from the movie and PS3 version by having it begin with Peter in the normal red suit. Your ability to switch to the black suit is disabled, so you use the red suit the entire time, at least until you get to the lower part of the level where Peter starts to question himself. He's becoming irritated with Sandman and gives himself the pass of just one more time. Said I'd ditch the black suit, but this guy's getting on my nerves. Just one more time. We're now able to relentlessly pummel Sandman like we never have before, and the fight ends with Spider-Man unleashing the drainage pipe as usual. The rest of the story progresses like we saw earlier, but I felt like these PS2 missions were a lot better at building up the idea that Peter knows he needs to ditch the suit, but he's too addicted to it. And I like the clever ways that Vicarious Visions aim to accomplish that, like with changing up the Sandman fight, as well as tying in the ability to switch suits at will. We'll talk more about how the Treyarch and Vicarious Visions versions differ in gameplay later, but for now, I want to credit Vicarious Visions in regards to their creative use of the black suit and Peter's struggles with it. Continuing on though, like in the movie, Peter then heads to a nearby bell tower and attempts to rip the suit off. Eddie Brock is also in the area and heads to the church to investigate. While Peter attempts to remove the suit, the bell starts ringing and he realizes that the sound waves hurt it. With the loud noise, he's able to rip off the symbiote and it falls from the tower onto Eddie Brock below. Together, they then become Venom. 
So before we move on, I want to discuss a couple things first. To start, I thought it was cool how the game's Venom reveal seems to match an early Comic-Con Venom teaser for the movie, where the screen keeps fading to black and ends with Venom leaping at the screen. Speaking of that teaser, it also featured an animatronic that was at one time being made for the film, but was ultimately scrapped. Here we can see some images of it, and it looks really awesome and a lot closer to the classic Venom we're familiar with. Speaking of the comics, I also like how this bell tower sequence matches them, but there are some differences. In the comics, Peter also chose to ditch the suit, but not because it made him more aggressive. That was actually something introduced in the Spider-Man animated series, where it made him stronger at the cost of making him more aggressive, as well as a little cheesy. You're the main course. The check's in the mail, baby! In the comics, the problem for Peter was more that the alien suit was freaking him out by taking him on those joyrides at night. There was also a point where it posed as Peter's red suit to trick him into wearing it. When Peter tried to head to the Fantastic Four for help removing it, the symbiote attempted to control his body to steer him away from them. Peter eventually made it to the bell tower where he used the sound waves to ditch the suit. Meanwhile, Eddie Brock was also in the church. What led him there was an earlier comic event. Rewinding a bit, Eddie was a journalist for the Daily Globe newspaper, and he was getting a ton of readers due to his exclusive interviews with someone he believed to be the serial killer, Sin Eater. However, unbeknownst to Eddie, this was an imposter. When Spider-Man caught the real Sin Eater, Eddie was exposed, embarrassed, and fired from the Daily Globe. Eddie even decided that he would unlive himself, but first decided to pray at the church for forgiveness. This is also when the symbiote latched onto him and the two of them bonded. What helped them bond was their shared hatred for Spider-Man. Eddie hated him for inadvertently exposing his false insider and getting him fired, and the symbiote hated Peter because it felt rejected by him when he discarded the suit. So that's essentially the comic's origin of Venom. Going back to the game though, Eddie's first order of business is to approach Sandman for a team-up like he does in the movie. However, I actually think the game approached this conversation better than the movie. To remind you of how it goes in the film, this is the first time we legitimately see Venom, at least for a moment because the symbiote always pulls back to reveal Eddie, instead of the character we've been waiting to see the whole movie. But anyway, Eddie basically suggests that they should team up to kill Spider-Man since he keeps interfering with their lives. Sandman agrees, without any fight. Personally, I found this to be very out of character for the Sandman they've established. Even though he killed Uncle Ben, it's revealed to have been an accident and something he's deeply remorseful of. So for him to just agree to kill Spider-Man here feels really out of character and very contrived just so we can get him in the final battle. It's especially frustrating given how the movie ends for him, but we'll get there shortly. What I like that the game does instead is have Sandman tell Eddie no immediately to the point they're about to fight, causing Eddie to turn into Venom. <laughs> Let's watch your temper here. There's children present. Penny! Daddy, I'm scared. Help me. Isn't this sweet? Just like in the movies. What do you want from me, you freak? Freak? I'm the freak. <laughs> Have you looked in the mirror lately? Now, let's talk about how we're going to destroy the spider. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about in this clip, but let's start with Penny. Like I was saying, I think having Venom use Sandman's daughter Penny as a hostage to get him to fight Spider-Man is a much better motivator compared to the movie. It is a bit funny that she shows up here at the end though, because I think it's the first time she's ever shown, let alone mentioned in the game, it's just expected that you've seen the film prior to playing the game. By the way, Penny was an original creation for the movie, since at the time in the comics, Sandman didn't have any children. However, he did later have a daughter in the comics named Kimia. This cutscene is also our introduction to Venom. To start, I do at least like that he stayed in Venom form this entire time without pulling his face away to reveal Eddie. However, the gargling sounds behind his voice and the way he moves around aren't really clicking for me. The movements in particular are a little too goofy when I'm wanting something more intimidating. That's not to say Venom can't be funny, since he definitely had a more humorous personality in the comics, where he'd crack jokes and throw out one-liners. But the game is a little too over the top for me in this moment. In their defense though, I think this is more of a trickle-down effect from the movie, since I think we can agree that a lot of its Venom decisions were flawed. It's not too surprising though, given that it's common knowledge that Sam Raimi didn't want to use Venom originally. Sam wanted Sandman and Harry to be the main antagonists, but after some prodding from Avi Arad, Sam felt like he needed to find a way to include Venom. Sam describes this further in an interview with Collider. But I had worked on the story with my brother Ivan, and primarily it was a story that featured the Sandman. It was really about Peter, Mary Jane, Harry, and that new character. But when we were done, Avi Arad, my partner and the former president of Marvel at the time, said to me, Sam, you're not paying attention to the fans enough. You need to think about them. You've made two movies now with your favorite villains, and now you're about to make another one with your favorite villains. The fans love Venom, he is the fan favorite. 
All Spider-Man readers love Venom, and even though you came from 70s Spider-Man, this is what the kids are thinking about. Please incorporate Venom, listen to the fans now. And so that's really where I realized, okay, maybe I don't have the whole Spider-Man universe in my head. I need to learn a little bit more about Spider-Man and maybe incorporate this villain to make some of the real diehard fans of Spider-Man finally happy. In an interview with Uproxx, Sam further goes on to describe why he struggled incorporating Venom into the movie. It was really more just that I didn't understand the character that well. It wasn't close to my heart. The best thing I like about Stan Lee and Steve Ditko's Spider-Man is that they made relatable characters that I understand. Even if they were confused, like Norman Osborn, they still have goodness in their heart. They want them to do the right thing, or Peter Parker, or even J. Jonah Jameson has goodness in his heart. When I read about Venom, which I hadn't read as a kid, I had to catch up on it when they wanted him to be in the movie. I didn't recognize enough humanity within that character to be able to identify with him properly. That's really what it boils down to. I think this is a good lesson in creative freedom and how critical it can be to the success of a project. Had Sam been given the freedom to make the movie the way he wanted, Spider-Man 3 likely would be looked back on a lot more fondly. There would of course be moments that I'd miss from this version, but as a whole, I imagine it would have been much stronger and I think you can kind of see it in the film we have. For example, Sandman has a lot of heart in the film and his character arc carries good emotional weight. I also like the majority of the plot surrounding Harry, but I did feel like his story needed additional room to breathe. When I look back on Spider-Man 3, I think a lot of my problems stem from the Venom side of things. Not just how rushed and poorly utilized Venom himself was, but also the symbiote's effects on Peter. Bully Maguire is admittedly the most fun part of the film for me, but it does feel inconsistent in tone a lot of the time. I don't know if I'm supposed to be laughing with Peter or at him, and there were certainly moments I would have liked cut, namely that cheesy club scene. Now dig on this. But my main point is that if we stripped away all these symbiote plot elements, I think we'd be left with a lot of the film's strengths and with more room to build on them. Interestingly, it was also revealed that a different villain was meant to have a small role in Spider-Man 3 before Venom was included. In an interview with JoeBlow.com, Sandman actor Thomas Hayden Church reveals in this quote that the Vulture was planned. Here's the quote. Because when they first pitched me the movie, Sandman, and of course, Franco's transformation to the Goblin were who Spider-Man had to deal with in the picture, and Venom wasn't even in it. They introduced at the very beginning the character of Vulture, but he was only in it briefly, and then at the very end of that picture, they were gonna bring the Vulture back to just sort of set the stage that he was probably going to be the main villain in Spider-Man 4. But then obviously all that stuff sort of derailed. Well, not so much derailed, but took a different railway. It's common knowledge now that Vulture would have been the main villain in Spider-Man 4, and some animatics and concept arts for the film have even made their way online at this point, but I don't think it's commonly known that Vulture would have actually shown up briefly in Spider-Man 3. Reports also state that Ben Kingsley was originally planned to play the role of Vulture, but due to scheduling conflicts around the time of the potential fourth film, John Malkovich would have played him instead. Continuing on though, that brings us to the finale of the game. While Peter's watching TV, he happens upon a news broadcast showing a construction site where Sandman and Venom have Mary Jane held hostage in a taxi cab suspended high in the air. Venom writes a web message for Spider-Man, challenging him to come to the site for a fight. When we arrive, we encounter Venom first. It starts off as a normal fight, but soon, Venom goes into rage mode the same way we use the suit for ourselves. I thought this was a really cool idea because it's intimidating seeing the villain using your own abilities against you, especially when you no longer have them. Venom's tough in this mode too. He's aggressive, and dodging just one of his attacks eats a ton of your reflex meter, so you're likely going to eat any additional hits he throws your way. So it doesn't take long to realize that a head-on fight isn't going to work. The solution is to use the metal pipe scattered around the construction site, and when you punch them, they'll crash and produce a ton of sound, leaving Venom vulnerable, the same way it worked in the film. This gives you a window of time to freely attack Venom, and you'll repeat this method throughout the fight. Venom is still a pretty tough boss though, and he can do a good amount of damage if he gets his hands on you, and he's a threat at range too since he can grab your neck with a web line to hold you in place. By the way, I thought that move in particular was a cool inclusion since it matches the way he holds Spider-Man down in the movie. After dealing enough damage, we then cut to Harry as he sees what's happening on the news. Keep in mind, we haven't seen him since we dropped him off at the hospital earlier. There's been no amnesia story, no moment of him remembering and duking it out with Peter, nothing. He doesn't even say anything here to show any kind of motivation as to why he would want to help out. But he leaves his house and dons his new goblin gear to help Spider-Man and Mary Jane. Surprisingly, he's now a playable character. Bruce Campbell even shows back up to give us a quick tutorial on how to play as Harry. So to start, I was pretty excited to get to play as Harry here, but it does feel a little odd to be handed a new playable character this late in the game, since this is the last mission. We're playing as Harry on his Sky Stick too, so it takes a moment to get the hang of things. The tutorial is also pretty sloppy. It tries to bring you up to speed on all the controls very quickly, but doesn't give you the proper amount of time to learn them. In fact, it rushes you through them. 
Partway into the tutorial, it throws a timer at you, and Bruce tells you to race over to the construction site, all while he's giving you the basics on how to play New Goblin. I'm going to let this clip play out for a moment so you can get a better sense of my struggle. Now, punch it because your friends need help. On the way, I'm going to give you a rundown of your combat capabilities. I think you might be a little distracted if I tried waiting to tell you during a fight, so try and keep all this straight, okay? You can lock onto nearby enemy targets. When you've got a lock, you'll always attack that target. You can also cycle through all targets. You've got light and heavy sword attacks and pumpkin bombs. You can also hold down a bomb button to charge up and throw it further. See how annoying and frustrating that is? Why would you tell me to race to the next mission and give me a countdown timer if this is the same moment I'm meant to be learning the basics of gameplay that I'll need for that mission? Especially if there's not enough time to even hear the full tutorial and it's just going to get cut off. It would have helped so much if I had been given an earlier mission to learn the basics of New Goblin before this one. Or if I had even just been allowed to stay in the city and practice the controls a bit before heading to the mission. I'm just speculating, but this had to have been a last minute inclusion because it feels so tacked on. It's also kind of ironic that we have a playable New Goblin in the first place, since there was apparently some drama regarding playable Green Goblin in the first game. I wasn't initially aware of this, but during my interview with Jamie Fristrom, he told me about how Sam Raimi had issues with them creating a playable Green Goblin. Jason Bear, one of the one of the one of the coders on on Spider-Man One, kind of whipped up this playable Goblin mini game mode near the end, and, and everybody's like, "Oh, this is really cool! It's a whole new way to play the game. It you know doubles our content." Like uh, almost everybody, I was like, "We got to ship this thing, guys! Like we we do not have time to make a whole another you know game mode with a new character, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But uh, they 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 kind of like they they worked late hours and they they got it in and then Sam Raimi found out about it. He's like, why you know this is a game for kids? Why are you like encouraging them playing a bad guy? It's like I got kids. I don't want them like you know getting this message. And uh, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he he really didn't like it. Um, but somebody managed to convince him to like let you know to let us let us keep it in, and so it stayed. But then when Spider-Man Two came around, you know he was like pretty adamant, like you know don't don't do that again. I also asked Jamie if they would have done a playable Dr. Octopus in Spider-Man 2 if there hadn't been this issue with Raimi, but he suggested they probably wouldn't have anyway since it hypothetically would have been a lot of extra development time, and he didn't think many players engaged with the playable Green Goblin in the first game. Still, I'm glad someone managed to talk Raimi down about the playable Green Goblin because it was a real highlight for me personally and a unique experience compared to other Spider-Man games. I can't really say the same for New Goblin, but we'll get to that shortly. For now, Harry makes it to the construction site in time to help Peter against Giant Sandman, and Harry tells Peter that he'll handle him. Peter is then ambushed by Venom, so Harry takes a moment to rescue MJ. This takes us to our boss fight against Sandman while playing as New Goblin. We're given more quick time events during this fight, and if we miss one, Sandman will swat us away and we'll return to try again. Now that we're at the end of the game, the quick time events are a lot more advanced, with them often appearing in rapid succession. Like I mentioned earlier, the cutscenes do look cool when you're successful, but now that there are so many button prompts, I can't even pay attention to what's happening in these scenes because I have to be so focused on the buttons. I did however enjoy the moment where Harry aims the water from a fire hydrant at Sandman. You have to hit certain areas to weaken him, like his arms for example. Once you've applied enough water to him, he'll be vulnerable enough for our pumpkin bombs to hurt him. It sounds like a lead up to a fun level, but unfortunately, this next segment was pretty disappointing. I thought in this fight against Sandman, I'd be free flying and doing strafing runs and it would be a really fast paced encounter. Instead, you're just strafing in a circle around Sandman to dodge the debris that he throws while lobbing pumpkin bombs at him. The wind up to throw the pumpkin bombs is so slow that it makes the encounter feel even more tedious. It's prolonged even more since it takes a while to reduce Sandman's health bar all the way. Not only that, but once you do, you're given another quick time event, and if you miss a button, you'll have to throw more bombs at him before getting a chance to try again. It's really a shame because I was so excited when I learned New Goblin was playable, and I think the sequence had a lot of potential, but it definitely needed more fine tuning. After that QTE though, Sandman becomes a sand tornado, and you're given another QTE to try to escape it. As exhaustive as the QTEs are, I did at least think these failures were pretty funny, and I think it's due to the whistle noise as you're being sucked away. Meanwhile, we resume our fight with Venom as Spider-Man, where we get another good QTE fail. There's also a pretty intense one, as Peter and Venom fall from the construction site. 
If we're successful there, it's Venom who gets the spikes, and it's pretty gnarly. And yeah, that's how Venom dies in the game. Honestly, as gruesome as it looks, I think the symbiote could have survived that, so I think the movie death is a lot more believable. But from here, Spider-Man returns to MJ to give her a hug after all they've been through tonight. It's not time to celebrate yet though, because Sandman is still up and ready to fight, at least for the moment. Daddy! Honey. You saved her. Thanks, Spider-Man. I'm sorry. I didn't want to fight you, I swear. It was just that Venom... Well, he said he'd kill her if I didn't help him. I had no choice. Well, she's safe now. That's all that matters. So yeah, it's a little bit cheesy and feels like an abrupt change, but it's still better than the movie where Peter just let Sandman go after he tried to murder him for no good reason. Sandman being a redemptive character is true to the comics, though. For example, there's an issue where Sandman has a drink with the Thing at a bar. Sandman tells him that he's been rethinking the way his life has been going and wants to make a change. Sandman then attempts to lead an honest life and ends up fighting alongside certain heroes for a time. For example, he joins Silver Sable and her Wild Pack team. He even becomes an honorary Avenger for a brief period of time, earning the trust of Captain America. This is short-lived though, since he ends up quitting the team after mistakenly thinking that Captain America was about to fire him, when in reality, Cap was just about to tell him to be more careful in the future. So he probably could have been a legit member if he wasn't so impulsive. So considering his comic history, it makes sense to me that the movie and game would try to give him a redemptive arc, I just wish it was more fleshed out. I guess we get somewhat of a redemptive arc for Harry in this game too though, because despite dying in the movie, Harry survives in the game. The last we see of him, he's getting flung away by Venom, so I have a suspicion his death was cut from the game. There's a reason why, which we'll get to shortly, but earlier I mentioned we'd look at how things end for Harry in the comics, and how they match the movies, so let's do that now. So like in the movie, comics Harry eventually regained his memories and vowed vengeance against Peter once again. After much warring, the two of them have one final showdown at an abandoned building. Or at least it was abandoned until Mary Jane enters the building with Harry's son, Normie, in hopes of ending the fight. Unbeknownst to them, Harry rigged the building to blow with the goal of killing himself and Peter. Harry also drugged Peter to the point he can barely move. So when they learn that MJ and Normie are in the building, it's up to Harry to quickly evacuate them from it. He does just that, and in a final moment of sanity, Harry even chooses to rescue Peter from the building before it explodes. Immediately afterwards, Harry begins convulsing and collapses to the floor due to an experimental goblin formula that he tested on himself. Harry's rushed to the hospital, but it's too late. Him and Peter make amends, as Harry dies by his side. So sort of redemptive at the end for Harry in the comics, and certain aspects from the movie match this, like the way he chooses to die as a hero, and also put aside his anger at Peter, and it's definitely an emotional moment in the movie. At the end of the game though, everyone's happy, and it closes out with a cutscene of Spider-Man swinging through the city, the same way the last two films ended. I always enjoyed these final swings in the movies, so I thought it was a nice way to end things too. It also ends with a great final shot of Spider-Man swinging at the camera with the final frames centered on his spider symbol, similar to the Spider-Man 1 movie where the final frames were Spider-Man's eye. But that ends the main story of the game, well at least the main narrative, since there are still some side missions to clean up, as well as some extra things to do around the city. To start, we have some new playable characters. Like we discussed, Harry actually survived the game's story, at least in the Treyarch version. Harry still dies in the Vicarious Vision game when he's trapped with a bomb inside Sandman. But Harry lives on in the other version because he's a playable character in the end game's open world. That is, if you bought the collector's edition of the game or if you bought him as a $10 DLC. So despite how I felt about his usage in that final mission, I was still really eager to play as New Goblin in the open world, especially because I remember how awesome it was to play as Green Goblin in the Spider-Man 1 game. My excitement quickly diminished when I realized how hollow this DLC is. So yes, you can fly around the city on your sky stick as New Goblin, and you can even use him to fight gangs around the city, however, you can't get off your sky stick. There's no jumping off and running around on foot, you're forever hovering which made combat kind of finicky at times. During these combat events, enemies and citizens still refer to you as Spider-Man 2, so the game doesn't even make a distinction between the two characters. Thanks for your help, Spidey. As you'd imagine, free flying around the city and fighting some gangs gets old very quickly as New Goblin, so you might be wondering if there's anything else to do as him. Well, sort of. There are races around the city that are exclusive to him. 
In general, time trials and games are usually my least favorite kind of activity to do in an open world, so it was quite a bummer to see that those are the only missions you can do as him. I tried a few of them still, but his controls just aren't smooth enough for them to be enjoyable. So overall, playable New Goblin was a huge letdown since there's just nothing to really do as him and he wasn't fleshed out enough to provide much variety in his general gameplay. He can't even walk on the street. As far as our other playable character, that's a fully unlocked black suit Spider-Man. In the main game, he was only usable for about a third of it and had some exclusive attacks to himself, so it's nice getting to play as him fully. It's not like in the PS2 version though, where you can switch at will and instead functions as a new game plus. So if you want to continue where your first game left off, you're doing that exclusively as Red Suit Spider-Man. If you're wanting to do the new game plus type mode, you're doing it exclusively as Black Suit Spider-Man. That's not to say it isn't fun though, and I definitely felt the power of the black suit as I started the game again, and it helps that you keep all your unlockables from the last game too. Continuing on though, there's still some lingering side missions to discuss. The first is the final mission for the lizard. We meet back up with Dr. Connors, who's developed a serum to cure the remaining lizard minions. However, it's up to Spider-Man to put the serum in the three dispersal devices in the sewers. Once the serum is placed in a device, swarms of lizards will show up in an attempt to destroy it, so we have to hold them off until the countdown timer is complete. The first two devices aren't too bad, but the third one is a different story. I'll save that conversation for later though, because I think it speaks to the overall state of the combat. But after dispersing all the cure to the lizards, the citizens will shed their lizard skin and we can see them grossly laying in a pool of their lizard remains. Afterwards, we head back to Dr. Connors, who thanks us for our help, and that concludes the lizard mission series. The next mission I want to discuss is the Mad Bomber story. Remember the beginning of the game with that guy flying away from that building before destroying it? He's the Mad Bomber. Despite it being the mission we're introduced to at the beginning of the game, it has no bearing on the main story and is really more like a side mission. I found that to be a little odd because I think you'd want to start off with something relevant to the main narrative. However, in my conversation with Jamie Fristrom, he stated that in the first year of development, they still hadn't received a screenplay of the film. So he recalls that they were mostly working on these side stories to get a head start, with this opening Mad Bomber mission being one of them. This storyline picks back up at the Daily Bugle when the Mad Bomber calls Jonah to tell him that he's planted bombs around the city. As you'd expect, we spend a lot of time during these missions defusing bombs as they're planted around the city. At one point, we meet with Captain Jean DeWolf regarding the bombings to help her with the investigation. She's also a character from the comics, and she also has her own series of side missions as well. In them, we pretty much investigate criminal activities for her, like taking photos of arms deals that are going down or looking into dirty cops on the force. In the comics, DeWolf is a well-liked cop, but she's also a bit of a hard ass, so I like that they incorporated that into her personality in the game. By the way, before you take the place apart, get some evidence, a picture, or something. It'll make charges stick when the police show up to uh, investigate the disturbance. Don't mess it up. At one point, a group of dirty cops find out she's investigating them and they set up a trap for her that results in her getting shot with a shotgun upon arrival. She ends up surviving these shots, but I wonder if this occurrence is meant to be a nod to the comics since she was famously killed by the villain Sin Eater, who also wields a shotgun. After her death, it was also revealed that DeWolf had feelings for Spider-Man, which he learns when he investigates her apartment and finds photos of himself that she kept in her drawer. One has him and her together, but he also mentions a photo of him and Black Cat, where Jean clipped Black Cat out of the photo. Jean had such a hard exterior that Peter never knew she had feelings for him, and I think we get similar vibes in the game where she's tough, but still sentimental towards him. I also found it fitting that she shows up during one of the Mad Bomber missions because her first appearance in the comics was during a team-up issue with Spider-Man and Iron Man where they investigate a Mad Bomber as well. In those comics, the Mad Bomber turned out to be her father, but we'll soon learn that the game's Mad Bomber is someone else. During one mission, the Mad Bomber attacks the Daily Bugle of all places and takes Jonah as a hostage on his helicopter. Here, we learn the origins of the game's Mad Bomber. Luke Carlisle, you're the Mad Bomber? But you're one of the richest businessmen in the city. I was, until those articles in your rag got City Hall to investigate my company. You destroyed me. You destroyed yourself. You were ripping people off. You're a crook. If you recall, the building that was blown up at the beginning was called Carlisle Industries, and we can find a note in a factory that he tried to blow up that states that he owned that building as well. So he's attempting to blow up his own properties as well as other areas around the city as revenge for his businesses being shut down, and he wants revenge on Jonah for exposing his criminal activities. This is similar but different to how Luke Carlisle was used in the comics. In them, he was also a businessman, but mostly a con man. He got hired into a company called Nexus using a fake resume. He then secretly began performing your typical illicit acts to make the company look stronger than it actually was, things like forgery, extortion, and racketeering. When the CEO found out and confronted him, Luke killed him and filled the role as leader of the company. 
He knew the company was falling apart though, and decided to pull one last scheme, and that was inviting Otto Octavius to the building, stating that he wanted to hire him as a consultant. What Luke did instead was gas Octavius and steal his mechanical arms. He then had the engineers at Nexus reverse engineer the arms, but also improve them using their advanced tech. Luke then used these new arms for himself, going on the run and robbing banks. Of course, Otto wouldn't let that slide, and Luke was eventually taken down by him. So yeah, the game uses Luke Carlisle quite differently, but at his core, Luke is an illegal businessman in both versions. Going back to the game, Luke then has a bomb collar strapped around Jonah's neck and throws him out of the helicopter. We save Jonah from the fall and then take him to the safety of a nearby rooftop. This is our final showdown against Carlisle, who fires rockets at us from his helicopter. It's not a super exciting fight since you just dodge the incoming missiles and throw them back at the helicopter, and I would have much preferred to actually face Carlisle himself, so it's disappointing that we're just fighting a helicopter here. I'm surprised we didn't get to face Carlisle head on, especially because they introduced a cool mechanic for fighting jetpack enemies like Carlisle in an earlier mission. You have to jump on the enemy's back and fly them into walls to hurt them, and it was actually pretty fun. It was the only mission where you do that, so I'm surprised they didn't incorporate it elsewhere, and a Carlisle boss fight would have been the perfect place to do so. In the PS2 version, you actually do get to fight Carlisle, which I appreciated in that game. One thing I do like is that Jonah's here during the whole fight, and he provides some funny commentary when we get hit. Someone give me a real superhero! I hope you aren't expecting me to get you out of this. I have a, an old war in Spider Loser is gonna be the headline tomorrow. Die on your own time, Spider-Man! We eventually blow up the helicopter, but Carlisle manages to fly out of it, and he escapes from the scene, never to be seen again. As far as Jonah, he gives Spider-Man the closest thing to a thank you as he ever has, which closes out the Mad Bomber storyline. Hey, uh, Spider-Man, I just, uh, wanted to, I mean... You're welcome. Our next side story is about Scorpion, who I actually think has the most creative and memorable missions in the game. After beating New Goblin, we're shown a cutscene introducing him, and a scientist who's controlling him. Mr. Goggin, I have another job for you. No! I won't do it! You said you'd make me normal again. Hmm. Dr. Andrews has done a fine job with your body. But your mind is still in need of an adjustment. If you resist, you'll force me to use other methods. Please. No. Not again. I can't take it. Let me go! I'd rather not resort to mind control. You're more effective without it. But it's your choice. <laughs> What do you want me to do? I like how sympathetic of a character Scorpion is in these games, and I really feel bad for him. It was the same way in the Spider-Man 1 game, which is where we last saw him. He was on the run and desperate not to be used as a weapon anymore. The last we saw of him, he fled from Spider-Man. After this interaction between Scorpion and the Doctor, we next find him out in the city as he breaks a prisoner free from a police van. That criminal is the Rhino, who shows no respect for his rescuer, knocking him out and then fleeing the scene. We've seen Rhino briefly in this series too, towards the beginning of Spider-Man 2. We had to fight him as an early boss, and we left him hanging for the police. Rhino's now on the loose, and Spider-Man shows up just in time to see what happens to Scorpion. A van pulls up to retrieve him, and Spider-Man learns that the company holding him prisoner is called Mecha Biocon. In my conversation with Matt Rhodes, he confirms that this is the canonical continuation of Scorpion, and that Mecha Biocon were the ones Scorpion was paranoid about in the first game. I thought it was really fun seeing characters return from prior games, and Matt mentions wanting it to feel like the comics in that way. Yeah, yeah, and that was one of the fun things for me, was, uh, you know, treating it like a comic book, right? Where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, you saw this guy, you saw Scorpion, there was something wrong with him, but you didn't really get to figure out what it was because that story kind of ended very, very quickly. So let's go back and let's kind of do a deeper dive on this character um, and try to do, to some extent, the sort of grounded treatment that the movie characters, the movie villains have gotten. Um, you know, so not just treat it like a super cartoony kind of thing, but really try to kind of bring the character into the movie universe in a way that will uh, fit with the with the movie elements. 
Spider-Man soon investigates MechaBioCon by sneaking into their building. Once inside, this level seems to nudge you towards stealth as you attempt to get past security. As it stands, the game's mechanics don't really lend themselves to stealth, so it makes me wish that Treyarch had experimented more with Jamie Firstrum's stealth mechanics, because I think that would have added a fun layer to the gameplay and might have aided this infiltration mission. As we explore further into the building, we come across Dr. Andrews, who's expressing guilt about Scorpion. She tells us that she was first assigned to him when he was a test subject at the facility, and since then, the experiments on him have driven him mad. Originally, the Scorpion Project was meant to be a cybernetics project for the government, but Dr. Andrews states that she believes that Dr. Stillwell has more devious intentions for Scorpion. Dr. Andrews tells us that we need to break Scorpion free and gives us a lead on where to investigate. So just to pause for a second, this is pretty different from the comics, but I do appreciate the little nods Treyarch are giving to it. Scorpion, aka Matt Gargan, was originally turned into Scorpion thanks to J. Jonah Jameson, who paid him to undergo an experiment to give him powers via Scorpion DNA. Jonah's goal was to create someone who could defeat Spider-Man and become the city's new superhero in his place. The doctor conducting the procedure was Dr. Farley Stillwell, the same as the doctor in the game, but gender-swapped. Although the experiment was a success, it drove Gargan mad and he became a rampaging villain. Stillwell actually tried to cure Scorpion, but got killed in the process. So Stillwell in the comics is more noble than the Stillwell in the game. Dr. Andrews, however, is not from the comics, but she does serve as somewhat of a love interest to Scorpion, as we'll see shortly. I was surprised to see another comic character reference during this level too, when we enter a room with a lot of electricity arcs. I'd better stay behind cover. Those electricity arcs look like they can kill me. Actually, this kind of reminds me of my last fight with Electro, except I think these things are smarter. It's interesting that Electro would be referenced here, since he's a villain that's never made an appearance in the Raimi movies or the previous games, so I guess Toby's Spider-Man has faced him at some point in the game's lore, we've just never seen it. As we continue our investigation, we find where Scorpion's being hidden, and it's under heavy security. Thankfully, we have a solution to clear out some guards, and that's to pilot Scorpion for ourselves. Inside, we find a console that acts like an arcade machine, which allows us to play as Scorpion for a brief amount of time. His controls are pretty limited, but it's a lot of fun fighting people as Scorpion, and I'm really loving the arcade theme with the lives at the bottom left corner and the score at the top right. Also, the music while you're playing is really fun too. Executive producer Chris Archer also mentioned that the arcade style is meant to be thematic and that the people at Mecha Biocon are so sick and twisted that they would make this mind control device seem like an arcade machine for their own amusement. I think that's a really fun way to tie the gameplay in with the villainy of this corporation, and I thought this was a real highlight in the game. After playing as Scorpion, we next head into the room containing him. He begs us to help him, and he tells us that there's a bridge in the city that houses the mind control rays, which we need to break to fully free him. Before we can do that though, another doctor spots us and initiates mind control of Scorpion, forcing him to fight us. We're given a small boss fight against him, and after dealing enough damage, the fight ends up outside the building and back in the city. From here, Scorpion runs away and we follow behind him. The chase leads us to the bridge where he said the mind control rays are. Scorpion is still fighting us though, so we have to get creative. The way it works is that we'll eventually get an opportunity to grapple Scorpion and then aim his tail at the panels to blast them. It's pretty hard to aim his tail, but it's thematic since he's struggling against us, and I thought this was a pretty cool idea and a unique twist on a boss fight. After destroying the mind control device, Scorpion is released from its effects, and is overjoyed to be free again. His joy is short-lived though, as he immediately decides to take revenge on Stillwell. Spider-Man manages to talk him out of it temporarily, stating that they should wait so they can catch her off guard. Scorpion agrees, and tells us to meet him at his hideout. Later, we do just that, and together head to Mecha Biocon to confront Stillwell. Stillwell was prepared though, as Scorpion is horrified to see Dr. Andrews apprehended by Rhino. By the time we chase them down, Stillwell has a gun to Andrews' head and tells Scorpion to kill Spider-Man if he wants Andrews to live. Scorpion refuses, so Stillwell orders Rhino to kill both Spider-Man and Scorpion. This takes us into a boss fight against Rhino, and it's a pretty awesome one. Scorpion fights alongside us too, although he's not super effective against Rhino. He's at least a good distraction at times, which is nice because Rhino can't be damaged head on. Spider-Man remarks that Rhino is most heavily armored up front, but that his back is vulnerable to damage, so we have to hit him from behind. To me, he looks more armored on his back, but I'll go along with it. I should also call out how much I love that the environment gets destroyed as the fight progresses. It begins with a lot of lab equipment and multiple levels for you to ascend, but throughout the fight, Rhino will grab metal beams to use against you, destroying parts of the lab in the process. Rhino is strong in general, but the destructible environment really sells how much of a powerhouse he is. So I really enjoyed this boss fight and I think it's the best one in the game. After defeating Rhino, we chase down Stillwell and rescue Dr. Andrews. Scorpion captures Stillwell and demands that she make him normal. You will make me normal again. <laughs> you poor fool. Don't 
don't you realize the process is irreversible? You will never be normal. You're a freak! Ah! I'll kill you! Stop, Gargan. She's not worth it. Let the police deal with her. Go to hell! She's going to pay for what she did to me. Mac. Please, listen to him. Let her go. You're not a monster. But I'll never be human again. Stillwell starts to wake up, so Scorpion decides to flee the scene. Andrews tells Spider-Man that she'll explain everything to the police, and Spider-Man tells her to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. And that closes out the Scorpion mission. I wish it had ended a little stronger since it's a bit abrupt and doesn't provide much closure, which I wanted since they did such a good job of building up these characters. One of the struggles I've had with the story in the game is that I'm not really getting attached to any of these characters, so the Scorpion mission was refreshing because I actually cared for them and found their relationships interesting. So I would have liked a little more payoff at the end, however it seems that the idea was to keep certain stories open so that Treyarch could potentially pick things back up with them in the event of a fourth game. In my interview with Matt Rhodes, he reiterates that idea. Yeah, I think the idea was always, you know, to to give us room to kind of revisit characters. Um, especially, I, I mean, Scorpion is a character I had real fondness for. Uh, so it's nice to leave him in a place where he's still kind of out there and, you know, and he's he's a much more ambiguous character in the in the game than he is in the comics. Uh, iterations of him um so i thought you know there's a lot of ways we could go with him why don't we kind of leave him out there and 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 see you know what opportunities we have in the future obviously yeah there was no there was no four but uh it would have been that that was certainly the idea it does feel like a shame to not see Scorpion's story in particular carry on since I felt his was the strongest of the original missions. Still, I'm glad that Treyarch were thinking ahead with the goal of revisiting certain characters in future games. Continuing on though, this was the last of the additional story missions, but there are still things to do around the city. For example, there are multiple gangs in the area, and each faction has missions that you can complete, and they'll also appear in random crimes. There's also a system in place that tracks your progress against each gang on their turf, and the more you fight them in each area, the more you'll clean it up, which is indicated by the different colors on the map. This was a neat idea, but not super exciting if I'm being completely honest, and not entirely clear at first glance. No surprise, but I do however like the approach Vicarious Visions took to the gangs in the city. On the map, you'll see various gang or police icons, indicating who has control in that area. Arrows will show when one group is about to move in on another, and you can try to intervene. You're on the side of the police, so when you complete a challenge against a gang, the police will now gain control of that area. It's really cool seeing control fluctuate between the different groups over the course of the game, and I like how you can clearly see what's going on moment to moment on the map screen. This made me feel like I had influence on the state of the city, and I thought this was a really engaging and exciting system, one I wish that Treyarch had included as well. Outside of that are also challenges scattered around the city. These were pretty typical, like time traversal trials or combat trials and bomb defusal missions. No pizza delivery missions though, if you were wondering. They also have skydiving challenges that I thought were a cool idea, but after trying a couple, I didn't want to do more of them because the controls were so poor. I did however like the daily bugle missions this time around. In the last game, they were mostly time trials, and it felt like there were too many of them. This time, the timed element has been removed, and you're actually able to take photos. Removing the timed element let me enjoy each mission more without rushing, and I also like that you're graded on the quality of your photos. This made me feel more like a photographer, as I tried to get all the necessary information in the frame and take a good quality picture. There are also less of these missions, which I think improve the quality of each one. Some of them were pretty cool too, like for example, following a helicopter that has a guy dressed like Spider-Man hanging from it, as he does acrobatic tricks or another mission where you're taking photos for a fashion contest that turns into a brawl, or my personal favorite, where you're tasked with getting photos of a UFO that's been spotted in the area. At first, Peter thinks it's just Mysterio again, referencing the last game. UFOs? Hope Mysterio isn't back. But no, it's actually a UFO flying around, and I think the purpose of this mission is to keep the streak going where each of these games had one. It was a hidden secret you could find in the first game, which I showcase more of in that video. And then of course, Mysterio did a lot of alien-themed antics in that game. So it's cool to see a UFO return in this one, even if there's no additional explanation for it. Aliens and Mysterio are referenced further around the Bugle too, since you can walk around inside and see some of their framed headlines. For example, this one states, Giant Lizard Spotted, with a photo of the lizard next to it, which I think is from the PS2 version since the faces look pretty similar. 
At the bottom right, though, is a section that's pretty tough to read, but the last few words state, Aliens threaten Lady Liberty. This is, of course, a reference to one of the Mysterio levels in Spider-Man 2, where he took over the Statue of Liberty. Another newspaper reads, Spider Fraud, not the real deal, says SFX Guru. This is another reference to the Spider-Man 2 game, where special effects artist Quentin Beck claimed Spider-Man was a fraud and challenged him to a competition. Another poster shown here reads, New appearance of the spider. The image underneath it looks like a black and white screenshot from the first Spider-Man game. The last frame newspaper seems like a random one, which reads, Holy cow! I believe this one was a movie prop for the first film that didn't make the final cut, and it's about a genetically engineered cow that kills six people. Also in the bugle, I thought it was funny that Jameson has a bunch of pill bottles on his desk as a reference to all the pills he has to take in the third movie. Drink plenty of water. The random crimes in this game actually have a bit more flair compared to the other games too. There are of course more of these standard random crimes that you expect to run into, but mixed in are also crimes that have more depth to them. For example, there was one that I encountered where a judge was injured by a bomb attached to his car by the Apocalypse Gang. I had to stop the gang as they drove by, as well as get the judge to the hospital before he bled out. Another unique crime I encountered was a heist, where I caught criminals staking out a penthouse. Even as I defeated the lookouts, the heist progressed as enemies infiltrated the penthouse while the owner was still inside. So I then had to enter the penthouse and clear out the enemies to save the owner. I thought these were such a brilliant inclusion to the game and really elevated the open world and random crimes to make them feel more lively. It's something I'd like to see future games incorporate as well to help prevent random crimes from feeling too mundane. But that's pretty much everything you'll be doing in the city. Before moving on, I did find some cut content interesting too. For example, there would have been a gang mission taking place in a warehouse called Ditko Chroming. Ditko being a reference to comic book artist Steve Ditko. More interestingly though is a cut storyline featuring Black Cat. The website tcrf.net found cut content regarding Black Cat and what her storyline would have looked like. Apparently, it would have featured Spider-Man assisting Black Cat against a gang called Sparta. Black Cat would have been captured by them at one point and we'd have to rescue her. It also sounds like we'd be rescuing her from a mech, which would have been the boss of her story mission. We can actually encounter some mechs during a daily bugle mission, so these might have been carryovers from the scrapped Black Cat mission. Overall, it doesn't sound like anything too crazy, but it would have been nice to see Black Cat return after having such a prominent role in the Spider-Man 2 game. I think she could have been an interesting character to interact with, especially when Spider-Man gets the black suit, since she could have played well into that dark side of Peter. However, I better understand why she was cut after speaking with writer Matt Rhodes on the topic. I don't think she made it very far. Um, okay. And the reason for that, more than anything, is that thematically she doesn't work super well with story-wise what's going on with peter mm. um you know one of the reasons that i brought her in for spider-man 2 in addition to the fact that i love the character is that she's a great foil for the problems that peter's having in the movie right He's really wrestling with Peter Parker, Spider-Man, uh, you know, which should be more important. And he has Mary Jane pulling him to Peter. Mm -hmm. So to have Black Cat saying, dude, just be Spider-Man, I think that creates a great kind of tension for him as a character. Uh, and, you know, she's a new person in his life compared with Mary Jane that he's known his whole life. Everything about them is really just kind of helping to externalize what's going on with him internally. So it just made tons of sense to have her. And it, that just isn't the case in three. You know, what he's going through in three is is really all about venom kind of driving it a wedge between him and or the the venom suit the symbiote mm -hmm. uh, driving a wedge between him and and the people that he cares about and there didn't need to be another wedge that know? makes sense as far as other cut content i also found the scrapped combat system by tomo Morwaki very interesting during my conversation with him, he described his combat system in detail, and it sounds very similar to what Rocksteady later did with their Batman Arkham games, in that it allowed you to rapidly and seamlessly bounce between enemies. Transitioning between them would have looked very natural too, due to the vast amount of animations that could trigger depending on the direction you were facing in relation to where your target enemy is standing. The foundation of the Spider-Man 3 combat was directional in nature, 
And so where the enemy was relative to my current facing would trigger different kind of lead in animations and I could push directions to go from one enemy to the next. And of course, then the if I'm here and I move over to here, I have this vector. And now we know that that's the direction I went. So if the next enemy is to his left or right, I can have I can I can reliably uh, know that I can do a transition that looks better for attacking someone to the left versus attacking someone to the right versus attacking someone back behind me versus attacking the person that's ahead yet further ahead of me. And we had a really great relationship with the animation department. We had like a, a relationship where it's like we could talk through combat and body mechanics and stuff and we had a lot of fun with it. So I think that probably contributed to this approach. Now there's like a matrix of about 27 different transitions in the directions. So now combat feels sort of chaotic, visually cool, and even though all of these attacks functionally are basically the same, uh, it always looks like it's mixing it up in a really sort of interesting and visually sort of like improvisational way. And so like I could go forward, I could attack the guy ahead of me, I'd lunge forward and attack him, and then hit the guy to my right, and then I'd like tumble sideways and kick him, and then attack a guy to my back, and I'd like jump off the ground and hit the guy and with a flip or something. Now that covered, that, that took a lot of animation bandwidth, but now we had this like sort of foundation of directional combat that felt good, looked good, um, and we integrated sort of a um, slow down counter feature. And so if I'm getting attacked in that kind of bouncing in that web of attacking enemies if i get hit it'll get interrupted and i get that interruption that interruption feels bad and i don't like that interruption and so as long as you hit the counter button which will slow things down and a flash occurs in that range it immediately transitions you to another set of animations for counter attacks which then sort of refresh the counter for the the the, the directional combat so now that is a noisy and sort of interesting uh, and entertaining foundation. And then of course you could then, now the other attacks though, there aren't as many, there's not as much depth to the combo. So jumping in web kind of create sort of like singular events that can come off of, off of that. If you think of like a ground floor with little cylinders, which are enemies, I could then bounce up from that, that, that forest of trees into the air and then come dashing back down to different spots, continuing that sort of web of directional attacks. And there was like lots of plans to kind of, get a lot of combat up in the air then and we were thinking a lot about like how you would evolve your play style for your fun not for effectiveness necessarily hmm. but then you get up and then you start pulling up people and start bouncing them around until they were all gone just because that was more satisfying and it was more complicated in the controls and because the controls were gonna lead to success anyways you would get to then have a sort of a safe space to try to practice some of those uh, more advanced techniques spider-man had i think if i remember correctly i think he had 12 meters of leeway to be translated to the target and that would happen in at most three frames okay. um so like and the camera is lifted higher and is further in in spider-man certainly than in batman um and so it the movement the size of engagement and the kind of speed that you're moving around between those points is, I want to say, faster than like Ninja Guide. Okay. And it's more physical space and there's not as much constraint. We weren't, that combat system wasn't there as a skill system, right? It was there as a more like a flow system, more of like an activity that just felt good. And then we were trying to add kind of like decision moments in that. To sum things up, Tomo describes his combat system as fast, less strategic Arkham. I actually think this combat system could have been really cool for Spider-Man 3. It's tough to say for certain since I haven't seen it for myself, but from the sounds of it, this could have provided a very satisfying and engaging gameplay experience for that time. Due to personal reasons, Tomo ended up leaving Treyarch about seven months into the development of Spider-Man 3, and he believes that's likely why Treyarch wasn't able to continue forward with his system, since he was the only one who really knew it inside and out, as well as the fact that the game was still in early development when he left. Still, it's interesting to think about how the gameplay might have differed had Tomo's combat system been carried forward into the final product. As sort of a bonus for this video, I also want to play some clips where Tomo describes the scale of the cut sewer area from Spider-Man 2. I knew that a sewer section was planned for that game, but I didn't realize just how large it was going to be and how it could have been used as a shortcut for navigating the city. 
it was basically just a gigantic amount of work that was done for a sewer, in quote system that was a very creative interpretation of an upside down city. So we just, we, we loved the controls and moving around the world and we were doing tests with large interior spaces. And the conclusion was that an inverted city would be absolutely fantastic to play in. But we didn't have any rationale for an inverted city. Not that we had a rationale for, you know, sewer spaces that were, you know, bigger than SoFi Stadium, but that's what we ended up doing. We ended, and we did a lot of it. That was the spaces where like the lizard was supposed to, levels were supposed to be. You know, we had like long sewer tunnels that you could use to shortcut through the city sometimes because mm. uh, an even 40 meter wide tube, 40 by 40 meter wide space, you could swing through much faster than the normal city because the normal city is variation and height differences and so we envisioned these giant tubes that you could travel through that if you were in the know you could then descend into sewer go fast and come back up but that was a massive cut and you know really a huge error in sort of workforce estimation yeah, right. yeah what we had going was really crazy i mean like there were like seven or eight interior spaces that probably had more than 100 meters of height nooks and crannies which were 40 by 40 meters and it was it was madness it's wild how ambitious the sewer area would have been and it's a shame it had to be completely cut from spider-man 2. still it's cool to see the sewer area utilized to some degree in spider-man 3. but continuing on i'd like to next talk more about the overall gameplay of treyarch spider-man 3 starting with the combat Treyarch attempted to enhance the gameplay this time around by providing more combo chains as well as making the gameplay more cinematic. I think on paper those are good ideas, but the execution wasn't there in this case. In fact, I think they relied too much on the cinematic appeal of the game. I think the most glaring example of that is the over-reliance on QTEs. We talked about them a lot throughout this video, but I really wanted to highlight just how many there are in this game because they're everywhere. I felt like I was constantly being presented with some sort of QTE minigame, and it really distracted me from the overall quality. Outside of the QTEs, I think the overall combat failed to meet expectations too. I like how cinematic they are, but they lack substance, and the button mashing is a big problem. One mission that really encapsulated those problems was the last lizard level, where you're meant to fight off waves of lizard minions until the countdown timer is complete. This was another mission where I encountered a steep difficulty spike, to the point I wasn't sure how I would beat it. There's a time element to it, where you have to ward off minions for two minutes, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you definitely feel those seconds. Not only that, but you have to protect a dispersal device, the health of which is indicated by that yellow circle above it. As this clip is going, you'll likely notice that the health of the device can drop pretty rapidly with just a few hits from the lizards, so they can wreck this thing very quickly despite your best efforts. I struggled a lot with this level and was only able to hold them off for about a minute and a half before they destroyed the device each time. I thought it could be a skill issue since admittedly, I hadn't really delved into learning all the various combos. AoE attacks seemed to be mandatory here, so I went back through the combo list to try to pick out a couple that I could use against the lizards. This task was actually pretty difficult in itself because all your skills are mixed in here and aren't sorted at all. Plus, you have to click on each one individually to see what it is. I wish I could sort through these because some of them are just traversal upgrades or black suit specific combos, so it was really tedious going through all of them. But anyway, I tried to pick out some combos that I thought could be effective for my next try. Still, I was having the same problem and not making much progress. However, I did find the solution after multiple tries. That solution was just spam triangle. That's it. If you just spam triangle for a heavy attack combo, you'll clear through this. So on the one hand, I was happy that it was such a simple solution, but on the other hand, I think it shows the flaws with this combat system. The combat can look flashy and you have a lot of combos to play around with, but they're not necessary. This is why I call this game a button masher. Since the various combos don't have much additional utility, what point is there for the player to spend the time memorizing them? We can just spam a random variety and see what cool things pop out while still achieving our end goal. This lizard mission in particular bothered me because I was actively trying to engage more with the combat system, only to feel punished in the end for it. I should have just gone with the simplest solution. This combined with the spider reflex mechanic led to a very hollow combat experience in my opinion. Everything felt very automated since I was either just mashing buttons or constantly holding down one button to auto dodge all incoming attacks, which just wasn't fun. However, I didn't have that problem in the PS2 version and I actually had more fun with its combat system despite it feeling more limited on the older generation console. I enjoyed it more though because it felt like there was more purpose behind every attack, like shooting a web ball to stun an enemy, or web yanking a shield from an enemy so I could open them up, or vaulting over a character to deal an attack while also getting behind them, even just the simple ability to web zip to an enemy improved my enjoyment. I may have had more combo options in the PS3 version, but I had more practical options in the PS2 version, which made the combat feel more engaging, which in turn made it more fun. 
When you add in the ability to switch the black suit on the fly, things become even better. Now I'm thinking strategically about when to unleash the black suit for that extra damage boost, and when to save it so I don't get caught in a bind where I need it, but it's on a cooldown. I love that feature, and I really wish it was available in the Treyarch version. I also think that the Treyarch version struggles with teaching the mechanics of their game as well as with general player psychology. What I mean by that is how the game teaches the player to play it since this game felt very counterintuitive and confusing at times. A good example is that new Goblin tutorial where it wants to teach you things but rushes you through them. It technically had a tutorial section, but that's not a good way to learn the mechanics of a game. Another example are the hint boxes. You'll be in the heat of a level when it decides to place a hint box on screen, and annoyingly the mission doesn't slow down at all to give you time to read and digest it. Most games will pause the screen or at least slow down time so you can read the tutorial box. This game doesn't, so you're trying to respond to things that are happening on screen while also absorbing that information, so it's incredibly easy to miss important details that you may not see again. On screen is an example where a chandelier is swinging towards you, and you have to find a way to stop it. Multiple things are popping up on screen at the same time, and you don't even have time to read the sentence at the bottom left corner. It took me multiple fails of this section to finally piece together how it wanted me to approach it. Despite this game being full of quick time events where when you see a button you're meant to instantly press it or fail, this one doesn't want you to do that. Instead, you're meant to hold the button down until the chandelier gets close to you and then release the button to punch. This is what I mean by things feeling counterintuitive, and it was something I experienced regularly in the Treyarch game. Another example is how the game issues important gameplay mechanics through these text boxes. On the surface, text boxes are totally fine, but they're not effective at ingraining information into the player's mind. It's kind of like learning how to perform a task by studying a textbook versus hands-on training. The lesson is much more likely to stick with hands-on training. For example, I had this problem in Spider-Man 3 when I encountered an important text box that mentions that you can earn health and reflex upgrades by fighting crime and increasing your crime fighter index. That's very important, but it's placed in the middle of a lengthy text box, the majority of which is about the crime fighting index. It's also not clear what you're supposed to do to get those upgrades. Do I need to focus on random crimes? Will I get upgrades for completing all the various story missions around the city? How exactly does it work? On my first playthrough, I just assumed I'd get these upgrades through progressing the story, which I did eventually, although much later in the game than I expected. On my second playthrough, I decided to try and get my health and reflex upgrades quicker by doing random crimes, which is what I assumed that original tutorial hint was suggesting. However, I did like 20 of them back to back and received nothing. So this was another area where I was really confused with what the game wanted me to do, and I think it did a poor job communicating these details with the player. Additionally, I was also frustrated by the fact that the game doesn't have a tutorial section in the menu or a log of old hints. So if you missed something or accidentally clicked off of the text box before reading it or just want to double check the wording on it, you can't. That text box was your one chance, which is not ideal and leads to confusion down the line. So some kind of menu for tutorials outside of just combos would have been helpful. What I really needed in this case though was that hands-on training, where the game purposefully navigates me through the process of getting my first health upgrade. That would have solidified things much better. It's also frustrating that there's no difficulty setting in this game, so it's not like you can adjust things if you're struggling, which I found especially odd because this game seems tailored towards casual gamers who just bought the game because they liked the movie. But these are areas where, once again, I think Vicarious Visions did it better. They have difficulty settings, and I like that they opted to use an upgrade tree. It's not original, but it's effective. In Treyarch's version, gameplay upgrades are handed to you after beating missions, and you don't know what you're getting until after you've beaten that mission. So I liked having the ability to choose, and I think the process of choosing helped ingrain those upgrades in my mind better, since I was paying more attention to each upgrade as I deliberated between them. I also liked that Bruce Campbell had some kind of commentary about each upgrade as I unlocked them. Talk about adding injury to insult. Now you can use the strong attack button while vaulting to smash enemies to the ground. Okay, obviously this move doesn't literally break the earth. The point is, anyone too close to you will think it did. Okay, so now when you mount some big guy and smash him, he's gonna feel it a bit more. And no, I don't have a family-friendly joke I can use here. Overall, a lot of the problems I had in the Treyarch version, I didn't have with Vicarious Visions. And in general, I was surprised at how much more I was enjoying their version of the game compared to Treyarch's, despite it being the last-gen version. I think it goes to show that no matter how much bigger and prettier games are on newer hardware, the gameplay and structure has to be there. Even with limited hardware, the combat felt more precise and engaging. The boss fights in particular were interesting too, because they were never anything super advanced, but they all felt different from one another, and there was clearly an attempt to make each boss fight more than just a standard beat-em-up. The best difference though is that there are hardly any quick time events in the PS2 version. There are still some brief button prompts, but for the most part, you aren't encountering QTEs in nearly the same way as in PS3. So out of the two versions of the game, I had the most fun with the Vicarious Visions version. The Treyarch one has the better traversal, is definitely larger in scale, prettier and more cinematic, but I'd revisit the Vicarious Visions one first because I think it's the more enjoyable of the two. 
And I don't want to beat up on Treyarch's final product too much here because I do see the ambitions with wanting to push their cinematic style and go bigger in general, but I think everything became too watered down in the process. It feels like a game that's trying to appeal to everyone, so it appeals to no one. Which is disappointing because I see creative ideas here, in these Scorpion levels especially, but for the most part, things feel too plain. And overall, I really would have liked to have seen Treyarch push their creativity further, even if that meant scaling things back. I should also mention that I'm sure the game would have been stronger if it didn't have to release alongside the film, which was out of Treyarch's control. Movie tie-in games are notorious for being rushed to meet the release date of a movie, so all of my criticisms about balancing problems and counterintuitive decisions probably would have been smoothed out had the game been able to develop at its own pace. They could have playtested more and iterated further on their ideas, and I think it would have led to a better final product. But I think I've harped on the gameplay for long enough, so now let's take a closer look at the audio of the game. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the movie's cast returned to voice their characters in the game. The only major exclusion is Kirsten Dunst, who wasn't able to voice Mary Jane in this game. You might not know it though, because the actress voicing MJ instead does a really good Kirsten Dunst impression. Hi Peter, ready to give me a lift? This voice actress is Carrie Walgren, and she's no stranger to other comic book roles. For example, she's played Gwen Stacy in the Amazing Spider-Man movie game, as well as Starfire in Injustice 2. You may also recognize her as Proxima Midnight, Elsa Bloodstone, and Invisible Woman in Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. But probably her most recognizable role in a comic book game recently was as Harley Quinn in Gotham Knights, a role that I think was a real standout in that game. As far as the movie actors and their roles in the game, I'm not quite as positive. Tobey Maguire is back voicing Peter Parker in Spider-Man, and like in the previous games, he can be pretty flat. Go get your boss. Tell him he's going down. Well, your artifacts are safe and sound. You owe me, old man. Patience, my friend. I'm not in the mood to wait. You promised to tell me the secret. Spill it. That being said, there are moments where I feel like he's giving a good effort, and even though it's not perfect, I think it's the best he's been in this game series. This suit, where did it come from? I feel fast, I feel strong, I feel good! I need pictures for tomorrow's front page! Spider-Man bolts while building burns? But he saved all those people. What's your problem with Spidey, Mr. Jameson? He's a good guy. Hello? MJ? What do you want? No, I haven't found out anything. Don't call back! I also want to compliment his combat recordings, where he has to provide audio for moments of exertion. It's not really something I paid much attention to in other games, and it feels like a random thing to compliment, but I think Toby has good yells that really sell the effort Spider-Man's making in combat. So I guess as far as Toby, I'm pretty mixed on his performance. It's really hit or miss in this game. But it's not just him. A lot of the other actors seem to be flat or give readings that don't really match how their character is emoting in the game. Oh, you think you're smart, buddy? Well, think again. I hit a bunch of cameras around here and now I have an even better shot than I was planning. You punching me in the jaw and taking my camera. So thanks. It's not uncommon for movie actors to struggle with voicing their game characters, though, since it's a different medium. They're used to using their whole body and facial expressions to deliver a point, so it's a challenging transition to then try and sell everything using only your voice. So I don't want to be too hard on them. I also have to wonder if there was a lack of voice direction in this game, since all of them seem to be struggling across the board, but that's just my speculation. I should point out though, that I think there is one actor who's an exclusion to everything I've been criticizing, and instead delivers a really strong performance. That actor is J.K. Simmons, voicing J. Jonah Jameson for the first time in this trilogy. Parker! That's the third call I got about giant lizards running amok in Gramercy Park. Giant lizards! Get me photos, pronto! Right away, Mr. Jameson. He's voicing his character with a lot of energy, and any scene he's in is instantly livened up. I think his energy bled over to the other actors he was performing a scene with as well, which isn't surprising when you watch the behind-the-scenes recordings of him with Toby and Topher, and how much fun he's having. Now, what does a piece like that need? To be thrown in the trash. I'll tell you what it needs, a great photo. You are absolutely right, Mr. Jameson. Of course I am. But Mr. Jameson, Spider-Man's been helping people. Horse shit. That's a scam. JK's also gone on to lend his voice to other characters in both TV and gaming, with perhaps his most iconic role in recent years being Omni-Man in the Invincible series. So I think JK Simmons was the real standout in this game, and I'm glad he was able to voice his character this time around. But next, let's talk about the score of the game, composed by Tobias Enhus. 
It's a solid score too, with some really awesome pieces that match the cinematic vibe of the game, as well as the movies. I think the best example of that is this track, which plays while swinging around the city. There are also some great themes that play as you fight certain gangs. I thought this next one was really cool, and it plays alongside the Arsenic Candy Gang, a crew of girls armed with umbrellas and teddy bear grenades. I also really like the theme for the Mary Jane Thrill Rides, since it has a very somber and romantic feel to it at the beginning, and then becomes very exciting and cinematic. Lastly is another one I enjoyed, and that's when you enter the Daily Bugle. It's a very bright and fun theme that I think matches the environment of the Bugle. So overall, I thought the soundtrack of the game was very good, and I thought each track provided some nice atmosphere to each level. Treyarch Spider-Man 3 has left me really conflicted about it. On the one hand, I appreciate the ambitions it has, like providing an open world that's much bigger than the previous games, even including a fully explorable underground section. And I also like that they tried to enhance their gameplay mechanics in a way that would be more cinematic and approachable to new players. I also appreciate their idea to provide more freedom to players and how they approach the story missions. So I want to commend them for making these efforts, but the execution just wasn't quite successful. Unfortunately, the game just feels very hollow across the board. A combat system with a lot of combos, but no need for more than half of them. A whole underground area of the map that I have no incentive to explore outside of story missions. And the extreme dependence on quick time events that take me out of the moment instead of immersing me further. This game is bigger than the previous ones, but also more empty. It also feels rushed, like it needed more fine-tuning before being released, which wasn't an option with it having to release alongside the movie. With the Spider-Man film having such a troubled production, I imagine some of those problems trickled down to the game's development, so I don't want to be too hard on Treyarch, but ultimately, I was really disappointed with my experience in Treyarch's Spider-Man 3 game. But as I've stated a lot by now, I'm much more positive about the Vicarious Visions version of the game, and I think it's the one to play between the two. I also think it's a good lesson in how gameplay is king, and despite Vicarious Visions version being on the older gen hardware and visually less impressive, it still manages to provide a more enjoyable experience overall. So it's the one I'd recommend you play if you're interested in trying it out for yourself. Unless of course you're wanting to experience firsthand all of the glorious QTE fail screen, which admittedly can be pretty fun at times. Thanks to those, this game's legacy lives on primarily as a meme, as does the movie, which sounds bad, but I like that they're still bringing people joy in some way, even today. I'd even recommend re-watching Spider-Man 3 partly for that reason. 
Bully Maguire is a lot more fun than I gave him credit for back in the day, and his cheesiness makes for a fun experience even today. I do find it interesting though how both the film and game weren't able to live up to expectations, and I think it boils down to creative freedom. Raimi wasn't given the full freedom to make the film he wanted, and it hurt the movie. On the other side, Treyarch limited their creativity by trying to appeal to too many people, not taking big enough risks or innovating in valuable ways, which leaves the game feeling generic. So my main takeaway from both the Spider-Man 3 movie and game is the importance of creative freedom and the risks of limiting yourself or your team creatively. In all fairness though, there were other variables that contributed to the game's struggles as well, such as a shift to a new console generation, the significant increase in staff after Spider-Man 2, and the fact that a good amount of the Spider-Man 2 team left around the time of Spider-Man 3, so the game didn't have that same creative fingerprint. Regardless, it seems the magic was lost between the second and third game, something Activision must have been aware of since Treyarch weren't asked to return for the Spider-Man 4 game. That's right, for a short time, work actually began on a fourth game and was reportedly being developed by Radical Entertainment. On screen are clips from a playable build that leaked online, but as you can see, the game didn't get very far into development. Ultimately, Sony wasn't willing to give Sam Raimi the time he requested to produce a Spider-Man 4 that he could be proud of, so he walked away and the movie was cancelled. That's a real shame, because despite Spider-Man 3's issues, I think Spider-Man 4 still had the potential to be great. Sam Raimi would have had something to prove after the third film, and this time, he'd be making the movie the way he wanted to again, which I think is the most important part. As far as the game, I think Radical Entertainment could have provided a good game to go along with it, since a fresh take on the series might have been just the rejuvenation it needed. Sadly, we never got Spider-Man 4, but from its ashes, a new Spider-Man series was started, The Amazing Spider-Man starring Andrew Garfield, and both movies had their own tie-in games that I'm sure we'll discuss in the future as well. For now though, let's talk about what you can expect in the immediate future from this channel. I still plan to continue exploring more symbiote-based Spider-Man games like Ultimate Spider-Man and Web of Shadows, but first, I want to take a detour into some non-Spider-Man games, namely the Guardians of the Galaxy game I've been promising for a while. Also, I thought it would be fun to explore some cancelled games, beginning with Daredevil The Man Without Fear. Thanks to some anonymous sources, I've learned quite a bit about what that game would have looked like, and I'm really excited to share more about it in the near future. In the meantime though, if you're interested in more Spider-Man gaming content, I have a bunch of other videos for him. Most recently, a very in-depth couple videos on Spider-Man PS4, so I'd recommend checking those out if you haven't already. I also want to again thank Jamie Fristrom, Tomo Morawaki, and Matt Rhodes for allowing me to interview them about their experiences, and if you're curious about what they've been up to since Spider-Man 3, Jamie of course developed Energy Hook, but he's also currently working as a senior lead networking engineer on Minecraft. At the end of our interview, he mentioned that if you've had trouble connecting with a friend on Minecraft, you should give it another shot because he's likely fixed it. As far as what Tomo's been up to, he started a studio called Hyperkinetic Studios and released the game Epic Tavern, where you run a tavern and hear the stories of various warriors. As you get them progressively more inebriated, you can recruit them and send them on quests, allowing you to unfold more of the story, level up warriors, and upgrade your tavern. There's more to it than that, but it's a fun concept and I'd recommend it for those of you who enjoy management RPG style games. Tomo will also be teaching level design at the Pasadena Art Center this term, which is exciting as well. Matt Rhodes now works at Stoic Studios, the home of the Banner Saga game series. They're also currently working on their new game, Towerborn, which Matt is a designer on, so keep an eye out for more on that. So thank you again to Jamie, Tomo, and Matt. But with that, I think that wraps things up for this video, so thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.